What's up? Dude, this is a uh, feels like no you have you guys ever watched like boxing where the guys are like this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> it feels so like then we uh we are officially on the arc that will take us through the very first season of Factor Fantasy. This is it. This is the one everyone's been waiting for. So if you think about all the requests that we had, it's been an overwhelming like amount of Harry Potter. Like this was the one that of all the requests we got, and this was the majority of those requests. <laughs> when you said that, I just kept thinking, feels like the first time. Oh yeah. Dude, I'm excited. Same time. I'm stoked, man. This is this is probably I would say this is the greatest franchise to ever be made now when we kind of went back through the movies yeah they definitely you know it felt like they were a little bit better at the time but definitely the books are probably the greatest fantasy franchise ever to be created it's funny you say that because like i agree to the point of like how it all came together in its entirety like it was all wrapped up neatly there was no big big huge issues that really anyone had with it like where there are some huge issues for other fantasy franchises but what i did notice when reading through the books this time around is i could tell they were really meant for younger readers as opposed because you know I'm, I'm looking at the type of words that were being used and how they're like the, the type of writing itself it was definitely directed towards like a younger audience you know like it, it took me all of you know two days to read through the sorcerer's stone right so I couldn't read through the Game of Thrones first book uh, in two days. It would take me like three or four. So I, just the level of writing is different, but I do agree in terms of totality and how everything was put together and creating this universe, especially for its time, it's unmatched. Definitely unmatched. Uh, by the way, so uh, for all of those that are listening on, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, all those things, we do have a lot more visuals today. You want to kind of go into that? We got some cool stuff on the table. Uh, I know you can see it on the YouTube. So you can go to the YouTube or the website to check out all the kind of cool stuff. Josh and I are pretty big Harry Potter collectors on this end, which is pretty cool. But he's, he's the decorator, man. I, I just sit back and do what I'm told on that end. <laughs> I, there would be a blanket on this table if uh, it wasn't for Josh over here. You'd have a black blanket and that'd pretty much be it. But Jay Nelly, man, needs to get that decorating license. I wonder <laughs> if they sell those. But yeah, you know, for the people who aren't seeing it, you know, just to give you guys the verbal uh, visualization, uh, for myself over here on my end, I've got the Sorcerer's Stone uh, hardcover book. I've got the Sorcerer's Stone uh, first DVD movie. Got two Funko Pops of Albus Dumbledore and Harry Potter. I'll, well, obviously, we'll put more out as they get introduced throughout the series. But these are the two that I had pertaining to Sorcerer's Stone. Then got to give a shout out to my boy Chase. Uh, he does he does this awesome like eBay bidding where he gets really cool items for very, very cheap. And he was actually able to get this uh, Hogwarts banner that you're seeing here on my table uh, for a great price. And he uh, he transported it over to me and it's looking great on my end. Uh, how about you tell him what you got going on over there? Yeah, man. Hey, worth every minute, the transport. So I always enjoy the drive over to Jay Nelly's house. Good stuff. Um, on my end, so just like uh, Josh, you know, pretty big. I think this is the only franchise, like, I really enjoyed actually collecting this stuff. Like, some other things like Game of Thrones, I'm like, cool, I have the books. You know, I'll pick something up here and there. But I've actually been collecting this stuff since I was a kid, since this is really the first fantasy franchise i even read as a as a kid you know um actually over here on the left which is cool this is the british ver version so a lot of people don't know uh when harry potter and the sorcerer's stone first came out it was originally released in britain as the philosopher's stone a lot of people don't know that and uh jk rowling uh joanna rowling what she did was the publishers convinced her to change it to Sorcerer's Stone because she thought American authors would associate it with philosophers and it wouldn't really get the attention of kids because it was orig originally made for as a kid's book. Um, so what you have here is you see the different cover art. Uh, it's actually a first edition first print, which is pretty cool. I found that at an antique store for like 20 bucks, <laughs> no one knew what it was. And I was like, steal of the week, yeah. 
I think the only downside is I think it has like the original guy's name on the inside. So I just scratched it out with a pen real quick. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> just like Jay Nelly, I got, um, you know, the one that's pretty sentimental to us all. Uh, the first Sorcerer's Stone copy, not a first print or anything, just, you know, one that's really cool to have. Uh, you got the Funkos in the front, uh, Hagrid, uh, one of my favorites. You got the Golden Trio. You got Ron, Hermione, and uh, what's his name? Harry Potter, probably the most popular one on there. And then on the left, uh, you got my boy Snape. I know Josh isn't a big Snape guy. <laughs> Not at all. But uh, you got Voldemort and then Malfoy. And then over on the right, um, you have two of the pretty biggest ones, uh, Dumbledore and McGonagall. And then I even stuck Neville on there. Because, I mean, he does get 10 house points. So we got to give him some credit, right? That's right, man. I actually I made a point of that later on. And before we get in and really start this franchise, I want to give you guys in the audience a, kind of an idea of what we're going to be doing this time around for Harry Potter and how it's going to differ from what we've done in the past for, like, uh, Westworld and Game of Thrones and, and things like that. So since, you know everyone has a pretty good idea and it's not high level reading you can it's very very understandable there's no sense in chase and i breaking it down like scene by scene you know to kind of like what we've done before because there's nothing really that you it's easy to miss right you know there's some parts in there that we've obviously jotted and you know maybe you know it maybe you don't but at the end of the day i think it's going to be a lot more fun if we kind of give you guys you know just like highlight big favorite moments fan favorite moments uh, we talk a little bit about the foreshadowed events as they go along through the books. Then we talk a little bit about maybe potential plot holes and discrepancies. And I know uh, Chase and I are really excited to give our top five favorite magical creatures for each book. And so today we'll give you our top five magical creatures that appear in Sorcerer's Stone. And then we'll end you guys off with our interesting facts of things that we had to do a little extra research on that you don't just find in the books. So uh, doing a couple things differently. And that's the kind of outline we're going to follow throughout this entire series. So we'll do those big five major key points today in Sorcerer's Stone. And that's going to continue on in Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire, Order of the Phoenix, Half-Blood Prince, and Deathly Hallows. And I, th I think that's going to be the perfect way to do it because as our audience members knows, as you guys are listening and watching right now, you know, pretty much all of you, I'm sure at some point has seen you know, the movies, or you've watched at least one movie or something. So you don't need to have this broken down like we did our previous franchises in the past. Um, we understand that just gets boring. So the reason you watch us is, you know, you want to find out new things and notice those things that really didn't stick out to you when you were just kind of watching it. Or if you did read the books, but say it's been 10 years <laughs> since maybe you read Sorcerer's Stone, right? So uh, that's what we're here for. But we're really stoked for this one today. And um, once again, you know, it's it's been a big ride uh, for us this year, just starting from all the way in January. You know, we started out not knowing where this was going. I uh, just recently got invited to one of the biggest podcast conventions that do happen. And, um, you know, Jay Nelly and I were able to work it out with our schedules. So um, that's going to be coming up November 29th, which is pretty cool. And, you know, Podbean, um, we've gotten a lot more followers on that, which is really awesome. Um, Apple Podcasts keeps going up, Amazon Music now. Um, of course, we have iHeartRadio and Spotify's always held its own. But once again, we're just letting you know it's a big testament to you guys because we had no idea this would blow up like it did. And we want to do this right, which is why we saved this last for you guys. If we had thrown the best at you first, it would get a little bit sad <laughs> later on. So we saved the best for last. We didn't want to mind boggle you guys with Game of Thrones or Westworld last. So you're all confused <laughs> and having to take the time to really be, you know, focused in. So you're exhausted. This is all about relaxing, having fun. Y'all have earned it from the beginning. And we're going to do this thing justice. Yeah, exactly. And talking a little bit about that too, uh, when we, when we talk talking about dates and, and things of that nature, we try to have a reason of why we start certain arcs when we start them, right? 
And so the greatest thing about this is that for those, you know, before we get into the story, you've already known this, right? Harry's parents were killed by Voldemort on Halloween. So we wanted to release this right around as early as to Halloween as we possibly could. So that way it coincides with really how the story starts, right? The story wouldn't start if Voldemort didn't show up to Godric's Hollow and kill Harry's parents. So what better time to really start a great franchise uh, than, you know, right around the Halloween and holiday period. And that's exactly why, to Chase's point that he said as well, we didn't want to bombard you with something. This is going to be something nice, fun, casual that's going to take us to a nice relaxing holiday period because we're going to finish our first season of factor fantasy with harry potter right so this is going to be really really fun and it's uh i'm excited to, to get into it man good stuff let's dive in man i'll let uh jay nelly himself take us away on one of the biggest fantasy franchises of all time Let's get it underway, my Let's man. Let's get a malice in the chalice, man. Before we get started, how about that? That sounds like a plan, brother. Cheers. <laughs> malice in the chalice. Cheers. FOF at its finest. Absolutely, brother. And so just to give everyone a heads up of what we're about to jump into, we're going to tackle the favorite and highlighted moments first. But what's going to happen is I'm going to go through mine from the start of the book to where they arrive at Hogwarts. Then I'm going to turn it over to Chase. He's going to do his from the, t- the start of the book to the time they arrive at Hogwarts. And then I'll take back over from my key moments from when they arrive at Hogwarts to the end. Chase will do the same. And then we'll jump into foreshadowed events and so on and so forth throughout the outline. So cool, man. Perfect. Ready to do it? Take it away. All right, brother. So I'll tell you what. And it's funny because like my favorite, like my first favorite moment happens to be a little bit of a foreshadow as well. And it kind of doesn't come up for a couple books. But I just thought it was really interesting that we basically start this series, one of the biggest key moments outside of obviously, you know, Uncle Dursley, right? (laughs) Vernon Dursley, right? Uh, Yeah, outside of him, like, you know, doing his everyday thing. The first real bit of magic that we kind of see is Professor McGonagall, she's the first animagus that we ever notice. She's a cat and she turns into her own self when Dumbledore arrives on Privet Drive. So for me, that was a really big key moment because obviously we see how huge animagus has come up later on. And she's the very first one that we see, period. The first little bit of magic that we get, you know? So I thought that was really cool. had a little bit of an issue when Dumbledore arrived and the words that they used in the book to describe the Deluminator in book one was called the put outer. Thought that was a little bit, a little childish. I think we could have done better with our wording there. A put outer, not my favorite. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, and in page 10 of Sorcerer's Stone, there is actually a pretty cool quote there. We find out that Voldemort reigned for 11 years, right? Because yeah, what, what does uh, Professor Dumbledore say to her, he, uh, to Professor McGonagall, Dumbledore says, uh, you can't blame them. We've had precious little to celebrate for 11 years, right? So that's, that's a pretty big moment there. So we kind of realize that if you think about it, that's over a decade of just pure terror and, and like people die. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that they can enjoy their celebrations a little bit. I thought that was a good moment that stuck out because I, I think that, understanding why people were so scared because i mean obviously if he was only in power for two or three years you know there's that sucks and a lot of people were hurt and you know all that but they're even afraid to say his name you know what i mean like he was in power for 11 years so long and they he would terrified the magical community to the point where they don't even want to say his name bro yeah. so i thought that was really huge and I also want to start really early. I know it's, it's kind of early, guys. I'm going to throw a Malice in the Chalice card. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so it's, it, and this isn't anything crazy or anything serious. It's just a fun personal story for me to get to know a little bit about uh, Mr. J. Nelly here. So when I was growing up, my parents were pretty strict. Well, you know, uh, my mom had custody of me. Uh, my mom and my dad had a divorce when I was very, very young. And so my mom ended up getting custody. So I'd stay with her the majority of the time. And uh, she ended up, obviously, she's married to my stepdad now. And they they live together. But, you know, very early on in that, I think I had to be like nine or 10 years old. 
and my mom and my stepdad were very, very strict with my stepbrother and I, and um, we had like a very specific bedtime and like all lights off, like they would come up and check. And if we weren't in bed, like, they, like we would get punished and things like that. So what I would do, I had a Game Boy and because we would take trips in the dark and for some reason, every parent told kids in back in the day that you can't turn the light on inside the car because it's illegal. And so like we would bug them to the point where they ended up getting us those little Game Boy worm lights, right? Oh yeah. You guys remember the Game awesome. Boy color worm lights that would you shine over and you can see and play in the dark before they had like the light screen. So what I would do is I would literally go into my bed, put the book underneath my pillow, have the Game Boy underneath my pillow. And then when they would like, you know, we would go leave the room and I could like, I would <laughs> try awesome. to listen. I would take it out, turn the volume all the way down on the Game Boy, turn the light on and just put the light over the book. And I would read the book when I was supposed to be sleeping. Um, That's so, awesome. and, and so what another part of that is, is that one of the things that you hear about Dumbledore is that he pops like a lemon drop in his mouth. And so what I did is I went and got like those box lemon drops from a drugstore. So guys, if you ever, like in my small town in New York, it's called Cortland. There's a place called Kinney Drugs. If I could relate that to maybe other places in the country, Kinney Drugs would be similar to like a Walgreens or a CVS. So I went to their candy section with like the little bit of money that I would get either through allowance or just whatever it was. And I bought a whole bag of them and I would sit there and like eat the lemon drops because like the only reason I knew to get those is because I read this book and how he ate them and he, he enjoyed them. And I always like admired Dumbledore a little bit. Well, when I first read it, I told, I was talking to Chase last night about, I got some issues with Dumbledore now, but uh, <laughs> uh, when I first went through this, uh, Dumbledore was one of my favorite characters. And so that lemon drop uh, story is just something that always stuck with me, how, you know, I was influenced by words in a book to the type of candy that I would actually eat and put in my mouth. So Malice and the Chalice card done. Just want to give that quick personal story. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's something we can all relate to. Like, I, I still remember to this day, the first time I tried what was made, Birdie Bot's every flavored beans. And my aunt, like, uh, <laughs> I think she was the one that tried like a booger or something. It was freaking out. She was like, oh my gosh, this is awful. And uh, yeah, that was like the moment. It was just like in the book almost <laughs> where Albus is like, earwax. It's <laughs> like, well, uh, that, and that's what's so great about those franchises we all have those memories that we'll always cling on to uh, because it, it really was like the first fantasy franchise besides like Lord of the Rings and stuff. But I would say for the 21st generation to really relate to as a kid. So like Lord of the Rings as a kid, I you got to give respect to Lord of the Rings, but as a kid, I, I remember reading it in eighth grade and stuff, but I mean, the first time I picked up Harry Potter was like third grade for me. Yeah, so. and I agree with you too. With the biggest point you said there was it, when you said it, like it relates to us. It, it, the relatability is what sets Harry Potter apart from Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings, the majority of the characters are grown adults, where the main characters in Harry Potter started at 11 years old and you know kept going kind of throughout our childhood too. Right. So we kind of got to grow up with Harry as, you know, years go by. He's getting to the next year in school, the next year in school. Now suddenly, you know, he's in his last year and he's, he's like at that adulthood age. So it related to us a lot more because we kind of grew up around that same age there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So we're, we're uh, yeah. I mean, it's definitely, I would say, uh, one of the most relatable for a childhood for everyone's generation, I would probably say. For sure, man. Yeah, dude. So let's let me get back into it a little bit there. I wanted to get back into some of the top moments. Now, the next thing I have, and this is just something small, but uh and page 12 of the Sorcerer's Stone, that's the that's the actual page where we hear for the first time that Lily and James Potter died. So that's, that's the first moment, you know, McGonagall doesn't believe it. Dumbledore is like, well, she's like, I'll believe it if you tell me. And Dumbledore's like, well, yeah, it happened, right? And in more or less words, right? But the key thing is, is the date. They died on October 31st, 1981, okay? So why that's crazy? 
and I don't think a lot of people realize this, this is something that might be new or take you by surprise. Lily and James Potter were only 21 years old when they died. 21 years old, bro. We're older than that now. And so I find that very, very interesting that uh, that was the age that they both uh, ended up being murdered by Voldemort, right? Uh, Yeah, moving on from that, page 19, we learned that Harry's bedroom was a cupboard under the stairs. I've never heard of that before. That's why it stuck out to me, like (laughs) underneath the cupboard of a stairs as a, a living arrangement. Like, isn't that like child abuse? I don't know. But yeah, I've never weird. heard that before in my life. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, then page 28, Harry uses magic for the first time, right? He lets the snake out of the uh, zoo, the boa constrictor from Brazil. And also, this is a little bit of a foreshadow. So I won't actually you know what I'm going to save that for the foreshadowed events moment. But Harry does something that comes into play really heavy throughout the entire series he learns a skill that he didn't know he had uh, in that moment when he sets the um, boa constrictor free now uh and the next one i've got is when harry gets his letter like they know exactly where he resides in the house remember how in the uh addresses said like cupboard underneath the stairs then when uh, Uncle Vernon moved him up to the second bedroom and said, you know, smallest bedroom in the house. And then whatever hotel they went to, like motel room, whatever. Like they knew exactly where Harry was sleeping, even to the point where it got to like the hut on the rock, like on the right. floor, Harry Potter and on the yeah. floor in the hut in the rock, right? So I just thought that was hilarious. And then also when Hagrid just blasts through the door, like he, like he just blasted the door like he owns the damn place. He's like, he just shows up there right on Harry's birthday, which is great. Um, you know, he actually even did the countdown with Dudley's watch. He was looking at the watch hanging overneath the couch and then boom, Hagrid shows up and basically turns his whole life around. That was the biggest, the turnaround moment. Harry learns he's a wizard, you know, and think about it this way. This guy's, you know, if he's not been abused, he's been as close to abused as you could be without being abused as a child, like neglected, yeah. unloved, unwanted, uh, you know, and he thinks he's basically no one and he, his life is just trash. Then this huge giant of a man, you know, 16 feet tall shows up and tells you, hey, man, you're actually a wizard that can do really extraordinary things. And by the <laughs> way, you defeated the darkest wizard of all time. So, you know, <laughs> like how, how much of a mind fuck that must have been for a Harry to just be like going from what he knew his life was to wow. Like there's this whole other side of things and he didn't even believe it at first. And I don't even blame him. Right. Uh, and so next thing I have for page 52 is how the mail is delivered in the wizard world. We see it. It's by owl. I know Chase has got amazing things for owls. He's going to want to go over today. Oh, most definitely. Oh, <laughs> most definitely we do. <laughs> and then in page 55, <laughs> we learn about the actual events of Harry's death. Hagrid actually sits down and tells him, as much as he can and as much as he knows of what happened that night. So that was big there. And I also thought it was hilarious that on page 59, Hagrid almost kills uh, Vernon, Uncle Vernon, for insulting Dumbledore. <laughs> He's like, don't yeah. you dare insult Dumbledore. Imagine that. Imagine this guy. Because, you know, keep in mind, the way he, Uncle Vernon was described was a thick, beefy man with a large mustache. So, like, he didn't, and he was, like, intimidating everyone else. He was always, like, the bully at work, at home. Like, he was just, like, you know – that I would say a bully is a perfect word for it. And then all of a sudden this giant shows up 16 foot tall, shouting in your face, angry. Like you must have sh- crapped in his pants, man. Like it must, have, <laughs> uh, it must have scared. I could just imagine like you thinking you're the top dog and all of a sudden this giant that could, he, he twisted the end of a rifle around in a ribbon knot. That's what he actually That did. was really cool. Yeah. He just like pointed it up at the ceiling. Well, that was the one that what happened in the movie. In the books, he actually tied it in yeah. a ribbon knot. Like, literally, like, as you would tie a shoelace. He did that with gotcha. the of a rifle. Like, that's ridiculous. That awesome. But uh, then he ends up giving Dudley, Dudley a pig's tail, right? So, right. that was hilarious. Um, next thing I have that stuck out to me is when they enter the Leaky Cauldron for the first time. And, dude, imagine, like, being famous and you don't even really know who you are. Like, straight up, like... Yeah. Like you just heard maybe last night. You, seriously, it was last night because they went to Leaky, the Diagon Alley the next day. He learned yesterday, 
about everything that the entire wizarding world has known about him since he's been a baby. Like, imagine in your brain what you must be like going through. Like, it's all, it gotta be a complete and total shock. Like, you walk in this place, everyone wants to meet you, everyone knows your name. Like, they like, yeah, they, they're in awe of you, and you're just like, like, hey, 24 hours ago or 48 hours ago, I lived in a cupboard. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I thought that was crazy. And uh, yeah, another big uh, moment that stuck out to me is when Harry gets Hedwig. Hedwig comes in clutch moments throughout the entire series. Beautiful, uh, wholesome moment there. I really enjoyed, like, especially how she was described in the book as like a snowy owl. I will say that's one of the very few things that the movie did uh, excellent job of portraying is how beautiful Hagwood was. So I thought I liked that. Right. But um, it was actually pretty cool because he ended up naming a Hedwig uh, for the, like he actually, with his books, he found the name Hedwig um, from a, a history of magic. And that book comes up big later on in the series, especially with, with who, um, who wrote that. So. Then the next thing I have that's really huge, obviously, is Harry getting his wand, right? This is a big mm -hmm. moment for all wizards. You get your wand. His wand was holly and phoenix feather. Uh, it's a it's supple. And I think it's also pretty damn crazy how Ollivander remembers every wand he's ever sold. Now, Chase, I know you're going to go into a little bit about wand makers and stuff. And the only thing I want to say is I don't know if there's any other wand maker that would remember every single wand that they ever sold outside of Ollivander. So uh, I yeah. thought that was pretty crazy. So, but still like 11 inches, Holly and Phoenix feather, great wand. And uh, then, then the next thing I have is, you know, this is something that was super genius writing, right? About this part, platform nine and three quarters. Who thinks of that? Who thinks of like, yeah. hey, we're gonna get oh, to this awesome. train station by running through a platform of nine and 10. And it's not even nine and a half because nine and a half doesn't sound cool. Nine and three quarters was perfect. I loved the writing of platform nine and three quarters and the Hogwarts Express there of how you get through to that. Also kind of like sucks on Hagrid's part for not being like, hey, Harry, by the way, you don't know anything about the magical world, but like, here's your ticket. <laughs> Good I'm not luck, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, imagine if like uh, Mrs. Weasley and like the Weasley family didn't show up. Like, what would he have done? <laughs> like, I know, yeah, I know what he would have done. So, <laughs> that's awesome. That that's uh, so cool. Then going on to page 101, the different types of wizarding candies. I thought that was super cool. That is cool. Uh, that's yeah. I didn't even think of that. That's awesome. Yeah, I wrote that down here, and I actually have a little bit of what those wizarding candies are, so I can give those to you guys. So. There was Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans, Drupal's Best Blowing Gum, Chocolate Frogs, Pumpkin Pasties, Cauldron Cakes, and Licorice Wands. There was also a number of other strange things that Harry had never seen in his life, but those were the ones that were listed uh, in the book itself. So I thought that was really cool. Something small to put in there that stuck out to me, different types of wizarding candies that you won't find in the non-magical world, except there are birdie bots, every flavor of beans in our non-magical world in real life now. <laughs> uh, it's funny you said that because I remember it was Christmas time um, when I was, when I think it was maybe 2001 or 2002 when I had uh, the birdie bots, every flavor of beans for the first time. But that's awesome. For sure. And then also, what I have is, you know, in page 100, uh, 108, we have the very first confrontation with Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle, and Harry and Ron. Now, I know we're going to be, so what we're going to be doing next week is talk about the differences between the books and the movies. I'll just say this. This does not show up in the movie here. Like, this is something, like, the, the confrontation between them, like, they go to take Harry and Ron's candy, then Scabbers bites Goyle. And like, you know, it gives them a scar. And that's something that does come up later on just when they reminisce on good scabbers times and a couple books from now. But uh, that whole confrontation with Malfoy, Crab and Goyle. And Malfoy was actually, he, they met in Madame Malkin's robe shop in, in uh, Diagon Alley in the books there. So those are some of the big moments there because those are the big favorites I have uh, from the start of the book to where they arrive at Hogwarts. I'll let Chase take his from that time and then we'll move on after the words. We'll talk about our big stick out moments till the end of the book. Chase will do the same. Then we'll go on to the other parts, which would be the foreshadowed events, 
then the plot holes, discrepancies, top five magical creatures, and we'll end up with our interesting facts. So, bro, take it away. Take your uh, big moments that you had from start of book to start of Hogwarts. Cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, kind of like Josh was saying about the wands and stuff, I'll get into that. That'll be more in our interesting facts section. I'll kind of say one thing about it, basically that there are other wands, but I'm going to leave that for our interesting facts section because there are some cool stuff there. Um, and then, of course, you know, as we get farther on, because we don't want to give anything away for the people that haven't read the books, um, that just watched the movies later on in this series, um, you'll find out even more about the wands. But just kind of starting from the beginning here, one thing I thought was cool, which we'll have a, most of our differences in our differences in the next episode. <laughs> but one thing that really stuck out to me, first of all, I love the fact that Vernon Dursley was a drill maker. <laughs> that was badass. It was so like relative for someone that, like especially myself, because like my background right out of college, because I was one of those people that didn't really know what he wanted to do. So I met Josh on the college program. We became best friends. And then for a while, when Josh moved back to New York, I moved back to Atlanta, I was like, I'll rent cars, man. I'll like be a car rental guy. And then like, it was so funny because it's, it reminded me of how that lifestyle is like every day you just like are ready to make like a ton of cash because you can control how much you make off commission. So I was thinking when, you know, Dudley was getting all these presents, I want another president. Well, he was probably like, well, that's okay. Cause I'll just do more sales on Monday. So I thought that was really cool. Also, one thing I really liked about the book, unfortunately, it wasn't in the movie, which I understand you can't really keep everything in there because the movie can only be, you know, two hours or so, right? Uh, at his job, um, one thing that was he was kind of noticing, you know, they were, it's not like this was the first time he had ever really heard of magic. Like in the movie, you were hearing like, there's no such thing as magic. Remember, he would see those people walking around like on cloaks and stuff. And uh, Petna, Aunt Petna, how do you say your name? You're the best Petunia. with Petunia. Petunia. I always, when I keep reading the book, I always say Aunt Petna and Petunia. Gotcha. She kept seeing, it was done a little bit different in the movie, but she kept seeing the cat that was there, which we come to find out is McGonagall. And one thing I really liked about the movie that was, we're not going to go into differences so much here, but. Uh, one thing I really did like in the movie was the first scene you kind of see, though, when Dumbledore approaches McGonagall, is you see the shadow of the cat. and <laughs> She turns into a human. So I just thought that was really cool um, as far as visualization, especially for the time period, guys. Because keep in mind, this movie was made, what, in like 2000, right? Like, it, it's definitely we have a lot better technology nowadays. But for getting the audience's attention for a franchise that you're planning to take somewhere, that was a pretty cool way to do it. And of course you had the put out, put out her, which I like the de-illuminator name a lot better on, but the put out really stood out to me there. Um, as far as that, a couple other things too, I noticed in the book, they did notice like when they were talking about things, like they would see when Dumbledore and McGonagall were there, they even said like comets. It was almost like, we'll get into foreshadows later, but almost like you're ready for the motorbike. And, and one thing that did stake out too was that Hagrid mentioned, and they kept this out of the movie, which we'll go into differences later, but this was a big moment that stuck out to me. He got the motorbike from Sirius Black, which we'll find out who that is later on. But that was definitely a big one uh, for me there. Um, after that, you know, in chapter two, the vanishing glass, um, I did really like, I thought it was cool. Like, you know, he was kind of interacting with the snake and the snake was like, I want to go to Brazil. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, and then of course you have the glass and everything there, but then the letters from no one. Um, I thought one thing I really did like that was cool was the letter. Um, cause I mean, you see the like seal and then you actually read the letter, but then especially all the letters pouring into the house. And, and one thing that really happened in the books that I liked that they didn't bring up a whole lot in the movie, which it's just a moment that did stand out to me. Um, 
is they went to the hotel at one point and even like I guess the hotel manager tried to give Harry a letter and Uncle Vernon's like no give me that like that's mine but that was just omitted <laughs> from the movie but that really stuck out to me because I kept thinking imagine your house is so filled with these letters like you have to move like there's no cleaning at this point Like you can't get a broom and just you know take all these letters up uh so that really stuck out to me there um and this is a part i brought up to you because this goes into the letter and i'm going to tell you what it said on it because this is going to bring up a really cool point that i looked into it's not really that big of a deal I just thought it was really cool. <laughs> so, but it won't go in our interesting facts section because it actually was written right there on the book, which was really cool. And I brought this up to uh, Jay Nelly himself because I was so like, oh, that's so awesome because I'm a, I'm a nerd. But so I'm going to read you what it said. In the book, when Harry takes a letter, it says Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry on top. Before the letter starts, this is on the envelope. Headmaster Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin, First Class Grand Soar, Chief Warlock, Supreme Mugwump, International Conted of Wizards, which I, uh, C-O-N-T-E-D, how, what would that oh, be? Oh, Confederation, it's Confederation. <laughs> Confederation, okay, gotcha. Uh, see, I gotta have Jay Nelly help me out on some of the, uh, some of the uh, extra little, you know, words there <laughs> the put outer that would be my thing he would use the de-illuminator but it says dear mr potter and this stuck out to me too because it reminded me of almost the trailer when i was like a kid dear mr potter we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at the hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment term begins on september 1st we await your owl by no later than July 31st. Your sincerely, Minerva McGonagall, deputy headmistress. And what was really cool is, so showing, and we were wondering about this first, that is this the Merlin that is King Arthur's Merlin? And I was like, at, even at first, I was like, mm, nah, there's no way. I looked it up. And I kid you not, and I'm going to back this up with another quote later that happens in this section that I'm talking about. Merlin exists. And the reason why, and this is King Arthur's Merlin, and just to tell you this, to prove it, I went online and sent Josh a picture going into what I'm about to talk about in just a minute. Someone got a chocolate card frog, a chocolate frog card from Universal Studios and pulled out Merlin. So my point is here, and I'm gonna throw the great debate card. Perfect time for it. Great debate card right here. So we know Albus Dumbledore is, from what we know in the franchise, besides we're not really considering Harry because he's not at this point yet. At this point in time, we know Albus Dumbledore, to our knowledge, is the greatest wizard pretty much that exists, right? Well, now we know based on literally written here, right in the book, Merlin exists. Who do you think would win? You go first, Jay Nelly. You know, it's tough because we don't know a lot about Merlin in this universe. Like what he's done. Was he more of a consultant? Was he, you know, you know, mm -hmm. like everyone has different uh, strengths, right? You know, for example, you, Professor McGonagall is great at transfiguration, not necessarily meaning she's great at potions and the, you know, things of that nature, right? So it really is going to depend. We see a lot of what Dumbledore is able to do in wizard duels. He defeats, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but, you know, Geller Grindelwald uh, in, in an epic duel. They have like this quest for power. So like, if you're talking about who would win in a duel, probably Dumbledore. Uh, but if you're talking about maybe who's accomplished more, or like, you know, a more renowned wizard. I mean, it doesn't get much, like, that'd be like the Michael Jordan and LeBron James debate. Like, they're yeah. both, they're yeah. both sitting at the table, man. You know, they're both, if Dumbledore's <laughs> ordering a steak, uh, Merlin's ordering a bone in ribeye, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? You like, it, it. it's, it's tough. Um, if we learned a little bit more about what Merlin was known for and what he did and like, you know, 
I'm assuming keep, keeping King Arthur safe uh, was not an easy task, especially for the time. So he had to have known some really, really strong enchantments and, you know, keeping peace throughout the country to that's just getting put together. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. King Arthur was what, 13 when he was king, maybe less. Yep. I, I don't even know. Yeah. Like, so that's, I don't know, man, it's tough. Cause we do know, we see Dumbledore in a couple of duels and not only the Harry Potter series, but also, uh, the crimes of Grindelwald, um, that's that, that type of thing too. So mm -hmm. if you're asking me in a duel, I'd probably say Dumbledore only because I've actually been able to witness on paper what he can do. I don't know enough about Merlin to make the decision, but I wouldn't be surprised if Merlin was just flat out the greatest sorcerer ever. And like, that's why like all these awards are named after him, like order of Merlin and stuff. So yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I have to agree with you 100%. And what's really cool, you brought that up, like if you knew more about Merlin, I'm saving that for our interesting facts section because I did do a little bit of research Ooh. based on a quote that Ron Weasley goes into because he was so into collecting the cards. And I did find out the information on Merlin uh, from literally a quote from Joanna Rowling, JK Rowling herself on Pottermore.com. So there's not much, but it is there on who Marlin and his sister were, which started um, his reputation, I would say, which I'll tell you about that later. So I'll have you kind of fully finish answering your question after I mention that later. But honestly, even knowing that, I would still, because it still doesn't give you a whole lot of detail, like especially in the in the books and the movies, you know, we've seen Dumbledore go head to head with these guys. And I would still, I think this is definitely one of the rare great debates where we agree 100%. Because I would kind of rank Merlin as your average day Native American, like kind of the guy that established it all, I would say. Um, I, I mean, he's got to be very powerful i would say like he's pro he's definitely no pushover but at the same time i mean the things we see albus do throughout this franchise and the series i mean this dumbledore even grindelwald from what we know which this it doesn't go into too much in this series but we know he took him on head on and won so just going on that fact alone and how throughout this series he has come face to face with the most evil, powerful wizard of all time. Both, I gotta give it to Double. He, he, both, du yeah. he dueled both of like the two darkest wizards of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I gotta give it to Double Door, man. I uh, agree with you hundred percent. So off to the Shadow Realms with the great debate card, man. Bang bang, brother. Good stuff. We keep throwing them early today. <laughs> That's oh. good stuff. Um, so after the letter, that's kind of when, um, you know, kind of goes into, I guess it was like, this is more of a foreshadowing moment, so we'll save it more for then. But one thing that stuck out, well, I guess, I guess like Harry is having these dreams like he had this like flash of green light when he's like dreaming which was like really foreshadowing Voldemort but that just really stood out to me because one big thing that I think they do justice in the book that could have been done a little bit better is especially like you know when Harry has these dreams or nightmares or when his scar is hurting like they describe parts of like when his, you know, it feels like his head's almost splitting open when the movie I felt like you know he was just like ah. Oh, <laughs> and you're like okay all right <laughs> moving right along but so i thought that really stood out hagrid you know uh your boy hagrid um i thought this was really cool when they uh you know he meets harry for the first time he says this quote that i really loved because it's not in the movie and he says i was at hogwarts myself to tell you the truth in my third year they snapped me wand in half and everything but Dumbledore let me stay on as a gamekeeper. Great man in Dumbledore. So, like, it shows, like, he was expelled from Hogwarts. Like, no one knows that in the movie because they don't even bring it up. And they snapped his wand. 
which I don't know if this is really the case. Here's my big thing, though. Ollivander, I'm going to tell you the quote in a minute because that was one little thing that stood out as well when they go shopping for Harry's wand. I think what was left of Hagrid's wand is in that umbrella. Oh, which yeah. Is, oh yeah. It's ex- I think it's well known. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I never like to just assume, but based on all the hints we get, I think you can agree with me. It definitely has some aspect of that. Oh, it is. Yeah, the wands, yeah, it, it's in the umbrella. But there's a, a big, huge plot hole issue that I've got with that and I have for later on. So I'm glad you brought it up because <laughs> that's going to come up later when we get into the plot hole section. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so then I have them going to uh i i did mention i did want to mention this real quick um right before they get to the island i thought i thought dudley the guy that played dudley actually played it pretty well because one thing that did happen as far as his acting i thought it was cool how he improvised remember he's like stomping on the stairs as he's like walking down the cupboard so the sawdust falls on harry and he gets all the way down the stairs and he goes back up and starts jumping on him. I was just like, wow, this guy. Like, that, that, I could totally see that happening in real life. This guy is a total jerk, is what's going on here. Um, so the, at the point where they get to Ollivanders really stood out um, to me. I did like this quote from the movie, because, I mean, of course, we kind of discussed the dialogue isn't the best thing. But it kind of was an iconic line. So I I thought it was really cool. And this wasn't exactly the way the dialogue went down in the book. But Ollivander uh, tells Harry. And first of all, he pulled out like three wands. I was like, okay. But I I was like, all right. Save Um, the differences for next week. (laughs) Yeah, we'll save that for next week. But he goes, um, the wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. It's not always clear why. But I think it is clear that we can expect great things from you. So that like really stood out because it made me remember like when I was watching the trailer in theaters as a kid, so stoked for this movie. And I just remember Harry with the wand and like the big gifts that always come up with the wind is blasting. It looks like Marilyn Mon- Monroe with a wand and a boy is <laughs> what it looks like. So I thought that was really cool. Um, I did think the books were cool that Harry does have to get because this is the first time like you do which we'll talk about one of these books later that I did actually read um, cover to cover for the interesting facts today Uh, one of the books uh, was actually which we'll talk about the other book later but so there's a history of magic by Mathilda Bagshot a standard book of spells grade one by Miranda Goshawk uh, Magical Theory by Adalbert Waffling, A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration by Amiric Switch, 1,000 Magical Herbs by uh, Field Despair, Magical Drafts and Potions by Arsenius Jigger, and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them uh, by Newt Scamander, which I thought was cool. I wasn't a big fan of Fantastic Beasts. We're not even going to talk about that, but <laughs> I thought it was cool the first time he brought that up. And of course, you know, he has The Dark Forces, A Guide to self pers Uh, protection but i thought fantastic beast was cool the other book wasn't mentioned but it is mentioned later on in this uh book uh book um so then it stood out the first time he met professor quirrell because he was kind of like stuttering and that sort of thing um also in the book you know he kind of runs into malfoy at this moment but you don't really know it's malfoy which was cool. I thought that was a cool moment. Um, also, I like this quote Hagrid said when he ran into Quirrell. He said, they say he met vampires in the Black Forest and there was a nasty bit of trouble where the hag never been that same since. Scared of students, scared of his own subject. Now, where's my umbrella? So we'll talk about that moment when we talk about foreshadowing events. Or plot then, holes. Yeah, or plot holes. That's I got a big <laughs> issue with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gringotts is, as far as the book goes, I, I do like this, um, because this was just one thing I thought was really cool, 
It says, enter stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay, must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. And we know what happens in the floor, which we'll talk about later on. Um, another thing I thought was cool is I love the currency <laughs> and the world. Like, I thought that was really awesome. You know, you have a, a galleons, uh, the gold coins, um, 17 sickles, they say, uh, was like one codalier, codler or something. And then you had 29 nuts equals a sickle. If, what's it called? I can't so remember. The bronze called. ones are nuts, silvers are sickle, galleons are gold. So those are the three. And it's like six sickles equals galleon. galleon okay. and 17 nuts equals a uh, silver sickle. So that's yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. 17 sickles is a galleon. Couldn't read my writing there <laughs> once again. Um, but uh, the vault, you know, that they do visit is 713, which I thought that was really cool. Um uh, you know, then at this point, you know, so here's what I'll say about the wands um, before we kind of finish up here. And I'll let Jay Nelly take it away. I'm going to get into a lot of this and in interesting facts. Um, but I do want to say it's here's what I'll say about it, because I'm going to save a lot of it for interesting facts. All I'm going to say is there were more wands than just Ollivanders. And actually, Ollivanders for the wands in this world were thought of, which we see it's proven in this franchise, even in the movies, even in the books. They were known as unreliable wands, which we have seen before. They were known as unreliable wands and known to break. Um, and a lot of people did not use them. And when we get to our interesting facts section, I'll tell you, I'm going to save a lot of them for later on in the franchise, but some big ones, like a lot of people don't know, one of the biggest wand makers actually was in America, uh, and she was the president of Ministry of Magic at the time, which I'll save for our interesting facts section, which is really cool. Um, then we get to platform nine and three quarters, who really stood out to me. So one thing that stood out to me was Hedwig, man. I love the owl. <laughs> I love Hedwig, baby. Hedwig was which, cool. That was cool, which we'll save one difference there for, for next week. Um, but at that point, you know, uh, I did think it was cool, especially in the book, you know, Fred and George kind of met him first. Uh, so I got to give your boys props, Fred and George. And then one thing I do want to say that's awesome. So at Universal, they used to actually have it set up so you would walk through the platform. Uh, so it, it's ever since, you know, the pandemic and stuff, things have been a lot different. But you could actually see yourself walk through this. And I did this before. With mirrors, it looks like you're disappearing through it <laughs> when you go into, uh, you're actually trying to get on one of the rides. So I thought that was really cool. Um, the way they just walk through the platform and then actually on the train, I'll talk about. So a big point that stood out to me here, um, which made me save a lot for an interesting fact section where you'll hear about Merlin is, so right before, right before this, when they get the candy, you know, and, and we'll save the differences for later, but basically like Harry was starving. First of all, <laughs> when he got on there, it wasn't cause Ron was poor. Harry wanted that stuff. Harry wanted all the sweets on the cart, just like a little kid would. So no, Harry ordered that for himself. You spent your money, Harry. Don't complain about it later. <laughs> but uh, yes, I did love, when they got on there and then Ron, he reminded me of when I was a kid collecting Pokemon cards, man. Like he was that guy. Like when I was in the third grade, I remember going out to recess and I like, it was for like that 30 minutes. Like I was dealing cards as quick as I could. I was trading, you know, the Pikachu for a Raichu and the Raichu for a Blastoise. I was doing all of that, man. 
and that's what Ron was saying. So the ones he was missing here, and I have the quote. Um, so he was missing Agrippa and Ptolemy um, were the two wizards he's been missing. He has all the other ones. Even Dumbledore, he was like, I have about six of him because <laughs> he wasn't surprised at all. Like, this is Ron's thing. Or for some people, you know, it's baseball cards. And we'll, I'm going to tell you about those wizards in interesting facts section. But I thought that really stood out there. Um, and then my girl, I got to give my girl credit. Jay Nelly's not the biggest fan, but my favorite person in the world shows up. Hermione Granger. The Granger things, baby. It's game time. <laughs> Granger things. And, um, you know, one thing I got to say about this, too, because a lot of people thought the dialogue was a lot different than the book. Actually, it followed a lot of it pretty well. I mean, you got to you got to change some things a little bit. But I thought like the scenes that didn't really matter much, the dialogue was pretty much on there. And I love how, you know, Hermione shows up and she's just like, pleasure <laughs> and um you know ron i do have the quote here because he was actually pra practicing magic at the time which i thought this was cool because it was pretty much dead accurate with the book remember he was trying to turn the scabbers yellow <laughs> and um uh, i do want to read that part because i did love this spell and she was like well it's not very good is it um but so ron goes when they're on the actual uh, train. Let's see, let me find the, uh, the quote here. Uh, so, of course, I wrote down the quote for the spell in the book, uh, whereas the quote from Hermione I have on my other set of notes from the film. But uh, basically, he was like, what was it? It was like water mellow, turn the stupid fat right. No, sunshine daisies, water mellow, turn the stupid fat rat yellow. And uh, then Hermione, this is what I love the most. She goes, are you sure that's a real spell? It's, well, it's not very good, is it? I've only tried a few simple ones myself, but they've all worked out for me. For example, Oculus Reparo, and then Harry's glasses go back to normal, which that's a big thing they downplayed in the movie. Because well, in no, the that, book, that, you that, know. That never happened in the book. That never happened in the oh, book. Oh, no, I'm not that. That's not what I'm saying. That's where Jay Nelly keeps jumping on me. No, the. No, the, I was the, saying. Of his glasses never happened in the book. I wasn't saying that. Oh, that wasn't what I was said saying. Oculus Repair. I was. <laughs> You're doing the quote. No, I was, here we go. <laughs> no, I was saying in the book, uh, they really talked about how Harry's glasses, because he kept getting punched in the face from Dudley. They never brought any of that up in the movie, which is good, because I mean, it silenced the violence, right? But I thought that was um, one standout thing in the book. But those were really the biggest things that stood out to me. But until I'm because I've got questions about that for you like this like his, his glasses were never repaired in the book like that never that whole spell that Hermione did on the in the movie that never happened in the Sorcerer's Stone book I'm, I'm right here on it page 105 the journey of platform nine and three quarters when Ron says like he tries to make the uh, scabbers yellow like sunshine daisies butter mellow turn the stupid fat rat yellow and he said he waited some wand but nothing happened scabbers stayed gray and fast asleep that's when Hermione said, are you sure that's a real spell? Well, it's not very good, is it? I've tried a few spells, a simple spells just for practice, and it's all worked for me. Nobody in my family's magic at all. It was ever such a surprise when I got my letter, but I was ever so pleased, of course. I mean, it is the very best school of witchcraft there is, I've heard. I ju I've just learned all of our course books by heart. I just hope it will be enough. I'm Hermione Granger, by the way. Who are you? So she actually never performed a spell in the book. Yeah, that was never my point. <laughs> but that you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, you missed my point true. completely. You literally my, said it. Yeah, no. My point on that was the film. I thought that was really cool. I said what they downplayed in the film when he was living at the Dursley's house was that Dudley punched him in the face to make those glasses broken. 
they are yeah they had like the uh, scotch tape that rolled up over the the yeah because he the glasses were broken like he was wearing broken glasses so i was never bringing up the fact that happened in the book because it didn't i thought that was amazing for the film i thought that was really creative but no if they had a couple of scenes where harry got punched in the face Maybe it would teach him some discipline. I'm just kidding. That's messed up. <laughs> well, even in the book, it was just in passing. And they never, like, mentioned, like, he got hit in the face. I mean, they, Dudley punched him in the side to get out of the keyhole so they could listen about the letters. And, like, he would he would go in memories and talk about how, like, he would run away yeah. from him because, like, to punch him. But, like, we never actually got any of that, like, happening in real time, either in the book or in the movie. Yeah, but it still happened. <laughs> he could have been, like... D- sorry my glasses were broke where dudley punched me in the face they could have said something but you can't put everything in there but that's what i thought just like the abuse from dudley was really downplayed which i can see why you can't just go put that in a film <laughs> especially but that was yeah that was my point i was never saying that happened actually i thought it was creative oculus Repero, granger things baby that's- my number one that's one of those things that I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's big enough for a great debate, but it's something that I'm going to wonder about a lot. Like they really oversold Hermione's importance in the movie versus the book. Like I'm not saying she that wasn't important in the books, but like there's a lot of things that she did in the movies that she did not do in the books. Like they over glorified Hermione's role, at least in the first one. So they I, did, but they didn't like, here's the thing though. Yeah. And, and we'll talk about differences next week. Um, I gotta say that like when I because you know Josh and I we literally like because we like to do our research too like I we both went back and read this book <laughs> like read it in detail word for word page to page for the most part like the dialogue was pretty on part like you can't like I, I get they left a lot of stuff out they left a lot of stuff out but for the most part, like you gotta, it was pretty much on point, and they they gotta make it their own some sort of way. Like if it's something like that, like I'm okay with that. Like I thought she was great. She was kind of the, she was that little spunk. Uh, I don't want to say talk back. She's a teacher. girl. Absolute teacher. Kind of had that attitude. She would have been the girl I would have had if I was in the third grade. I would have had a total crush on her when I was eleven. <laughs> That's for, still but, still nowadays. Yeah, she she is awesome. We'll uh, talk. By yeah. the way, Malice in the Chalice. Malice in the Chalice. I got to tell a quick story on this. Malice <laughs> in the Chalice. I might have even said it before on one of these episodes. Sir Emma Watson went to Brown University. This was uh like two years after deathly hallows the movie came out came out she was still there before she graduated it is on youtube and you can look it up so she was in class and the professor asked a question and she actually was the first one to raise her hand she answered it answered it correctly (laughs) the professor professor goes thanks emma and then this dude in the back just trying to be a total jerk goes 10 points for gryffindor (laughs) <laughs> it was fantastic so that's my quick malice in the chalice man that's hilarious i didn't know that yeah so i i would have been that she would have she would have hated me if i was in that class because i i i laugh inappropriate all the time just because at the most inopportune times because that's my personality so i would have i couldn't have probably even stopped laughing and she would have given me the death stare which is exactly what she did to this kid which is exactly what Hermione Granger would do, would have done. You got dirt on your nose right there. <laughs> yeah, so that's just what stood out to me up until the point they get to Hogwarts. Some of my favorite moments, not really big detailed moments, um, but just ones I, I, I just loved for the film and the book. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. It, but and, and, like, it's tough because like, I want to talk about why I believe that her role was overplayed in the movie versus what it was in the first book. But to do that, I'd have to go into differences. And that's really what we're doing next week. And I don't want to steal over any of our thunder yeah. next week. But there's a lot of moments where Hermione does big things in the movies that she doesn't do in the books. And we'll and- go over them later on. Yeah. It just it just bugs me. Like, they, cha- they changed it, a lot of it. But 
anyways, <laughs> one other yeah. thing, just because I found the page while we were talking about like the um, money in in uh, mm-hmm. Wizarding World. So that the currency exchange is uh, 17 silver sickles to a galleon and 29 bronze nuts to a sickle. So mm-hmm. 29 nuts to a sickle, 17 sickles to a galleon. Cool. Good stuff. Bang, bang, choo-choo train. <laughs> now we'll, awesome. we'll get into some of my favorite moments and the ones that stood out to me uh, when they entered Hogwarts. So I'll start here at page 115. In page 115, I thought it was really cool because this is the first time, at least in literature, where like you got to see ghosts for the first time in kind of like a friendly sense as well. Like they were, they were just flying through the walls, like stopping by, like they, they, they took the first years by surprise, right? Because remember the first years, they, they arrived by the lake because they have to get sorted into their houses, right? So I just thought it was really cool that uh, we got to see a little bit about the, the houses, um yeah man now the uh the second thing that i have that i thought was really cool is page 123 how the feast automatically appears on their plates like they like they are sitting there and it magically appears we learn later on how that actually happens i don't want to get any of our thunder for later episodes that we'll do in the future but that is a moment that's pretty cool of how the feast appears on the plates for the kids um now this is something i find really funny because it never comes up like either in the movie or in any books again so i want to uh (laughs) i want to just address this really quickly the hogwarts school song that That (laughs) that was awesome i thought that was cool yeah i just don't understand what in the world? I'm not going to sing this for you guys. I'm going to read it because I don't want oh, you to should complete. sing it, Jay Nelly. Let's hear those vocals to the uh, test. I, that's, that's just not going to happen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tongue, the teeth, and the lips. <laughs> yeah. So page 128. This is the Hogwarts school song that, number one, we never hear come up again in any of the movies or any of the books. And it's just kind of silly. Like, this is what your school song is, really? So it's Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Warty Hogwarts, teach us something, please. Whether we be old and bald or young with scabby knees, our heads could fill a filling with some interesting stuff. For now they're bare and full of air, dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us things worth knowing, bring us back what we forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest and learn until our brains all rot. So that is the, that is the Hogwarts <laughs> theme song, like or their school song. I just thought that was a really interesting um, moment there. Uh, going forward into the, my next one that really stuck out to me and one of my, actually one of my favorite moments period uh, in the whole series is when um, they do flying lessons in page 146 and 147 here in Sorcerer's Stone. So flying lessons, remember guys, Harry has no magical training in anything. He doesn't know what he's doing from any, like he, he thinks he's going to be far behind in his classes because this is all brand new to him. You know, some people come from muggle families, but remember one of his worries was like, he thinks he's going to be the worst in the class because he's just brand new to everything. Well, this is one thing that he was just immediately good at for no reason. Remember, they all tried to get the broom to go up and only like two of them were able to get the broom to immediately go up into their hands. Yeah. And like, Harry is one of them. And obviously Malfoy was the other, like the good and bad, right? <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so I thought that was really cool. And going into that as well, when Neville fell and broke his arm and Malfoy and Harry had their second big confrontation on broomsticks in the air, Harry tried to run him right off his broom. And, <laughs> and like, and like Mal, remember, Malfoy was always bragging about how good he is on a broom. And he's been like flying since he's been a baby. This is Harry's first time touching a broomstick. And he's outclassing Malfoy on it. And he just like, out of, like, like he's done it his whole life then when Malfoy throws the remember all and he makes that amazing like catch and dive was cool. and super awesome like we never see anything like that in any other books that I read to that point because like you know I grew up reading like fantasy fiction books and I like, I was telling you last night before we did our episode today I read Del Toro Quest those small little ones and mm-hmm. like I, I just never see anything like that and it was really really interesting to learn about flying broomsticks and there's a whole sport that goes with it I'm not going to steal any of your thunder when it comes to 
Oh, you're good, man. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I know Chase has got some really amazing stuff for us later on today uh, when it comes to Quidditch and facts about it. So I'll leave it there with uh, page 146, 147 of the flying lessons and the remember all um, scene that popped out to me. Going on from there as well, this is something that's super, like, I don't know if you guys would know this. There's only like three spells that we learn in all of the Sorcerer's Stone in the book itself. And like in the movies, we'll talk about those differences next week. But the first, um, the first spell that we see, we see teachers doing magic, right? We see them doing things, but we actually never hear the verbal spell. The first one that we see and used with the spell words itself is the Alohomora charm to unlock the, to get away from Filch, they unlocked it. And that's where surprise, surprise, they found Fluffy. <laughs> like the three-headed dog, right? <laughs> but I just thought it stuck out to me because that's the very, very first spell. In the, of all spells that you can think of in the entire Harry Potter series, Alohomora is probably not the first one that comes to mind, but it's the very first one that we see uh, in script. Then we, uh, again, later on in page 160, we meet Fluffy without really knowing about him yet. At that point in time, he's just described as like, a three-headed dog whose body took up between the floor and the ceiling. Can you imagine just a dog like sitting down and like his butt's on the ground and his head's touching the ceiling, but there's three heads also. And like the eyes were <laughs> rolling back, like the way they described it. So freaking awesome, man. Like that was That's really, awesome. really uh, creative thinking. I know it was kind of like meant to be like the Cerebus, like hell dog. Like that's kind of what he's based off of, but I thought that was really cool. That's awesome. Um, then going on a little bit further from there in page 167 and 170, we actually learn the rules of Quidditch, right? We learn about like the three chasers, the keeper, the two beaters and the seeker and what each one does. And I don't want to, like I said, I'll let Chase go through all of that. I just wanted to just detail what stood out to me there, which was um, the rules of there's an actual sport in the wizarding world that people are as fanatic about. So it's, it's funny because Chase and I are really big football fans. So <laughs> we really try, you know, we record on Sundays and we really try to uh, make it so we can still catch our favorite teams playing a lot of the time. So that's how big of fans we are, even though our teams are not great. He's a Falcons fan. I'm a Giants fan. Uh, Giants haven't won a game. I don't think the Falcons <laughs> have won a game yet either, right? Oh, no. Oh, and yeah. four? Even, even oh, and four, better. baby. Hey, at least when your Giants get beat, you know they're about to get beat. <laughs> Mine make you wait the entire game until you find out at the very end they lost. That's right. So, That's right. But right. Yeah, so I thought it was 8.45 cool. a.m. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, 8.45 a.m. So I just thought it was really cool because, you know, there's a sport in the Wizarding World that they are very passionate about, kind of like we are with our sports. Um, That's awesome. The second uh, spell that we learn in page 171 is when guardian leviosa which uh you know there like i'll let chase do his whole because i know he's probably got stuff on it and i didn't find it that important <laughs> other than the fact that it's the second verbal spell that we hear in this book so you hear all the cool ones you know later on in the series the ones that stick out but the first two that we learn very very basic alohomora unlocks the door when guardian leviosa levitates objects like that's literally <laughs> that's awesome. the, the two ones that that uh mm -hmm. that come up and you know then the, 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 she actually annoyed. This is where Hermione actually annoys Ron. Remember, these these people weren't friends. Like yeah, Harry, Harry and Ron were friends, but they were not. They did not like Hermione until a little bit further here. Actually, uh, three pages from here, when the the whole troll scene happens. Right. Now, the troll scene is one of my very favorites in the book because when you're a kid and you're reading about stuff, like when you look at a twelve foot mountain troll. And then yeah. how it was described with like horny feet, uh, gray, like dull gray, like granite body. Like just what you could think about is like, it's almost like you would think of a giant. Cause like trolls growing up, like tr the troll under the bridge, they're, they're not really imposing physically. What the way this troll was described, this mountain troll, it was like, you're fighting a giant. So I thought that was really cool. And there was a lot of differences in this 
part between the books and movies I'll talk about next week, but I've got an issue with this as well. Again, where Hermione like amazingly keeps her calm in the movies where <laughs> in the book she's frozen in fear and cowering and can't freaking speak. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, oh right. man. Troll in the dungeon. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. Uh, then like, you know, the two, well actually, like, really it's two, Harry and Ron like 11 year olds without any really magical experience just happened to overcome a 12 foot mountain troll. Super cool. They saved Hermione. Then Hermione like lies for them to get them out of trouble. And since they all, you know, get like did something for each other in that moment, that's when they finally became friends. It took 174 pages before they were friends. Um, <laughs> I thought that was really cool, man. No, I'm sorry. On page 179, uh, Hermione becomes a friend because this is the actual quote from the book. I'll read it to you. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty cool. It said, uh, from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other and knocking out a 12 foot mountain troll is one of them. That's awesome. <laughs> so, that's when here, uh, yeah, page 179 of Sorcerer's Stone is when you think they're, they're great friends. Like the way the series goes, if you're not thinking about it, you think they're just friends the whole time because of how close they are throughout the series. But it took a very long time. It took until after Halloween. So two months into their school year before they even liked each other a little bit. Yep. <laughs> like That's they awesome. hated her to start with. Um, then uh, next one I have is page 182 when Snape shows Filch his bloody and mangled leg. And then he says like, you know, how can you keep, how am I supposed to pay attention to three heads at once? So awesome. Dog bit That's Snape. Awesome. I hate Snape. So <laughs> I thought that That's was cool. great. Um, and then we get to pages 189 through 191, which is the very first Quidditch match that we see in the book. Uh, it's Gryffindor versus Slytherin. Again, not taking any of Chase's uh, thunder from Quidditch. Good, Quidditch. man. I'll yeah. just uh, tell the one part that stuck out to me is him getting bucked off his broom. And That's a little awesome. bit about that. That's going to get into our plot holes for me, I think. Or, uh, yeah, I think that's going to that's gonna be something I bring up there a little bit about this um it doesn't make sense to me in terms of like if they know someone's trying to curse harry how did they let it go so far without like no one doing anything so that was yeah. my that was my fault that problem with that and i'll talk about that a little later on but the start the part that stuck out for me is like the way you described in the book is like it was vibrating bucked him off to the part where he was holding on with one hand like so far in the yeah. air and like Fred and George, the beaters were circling around underneath him, waiting to catch him because they, because every time they tried to go up to get him off the broom, it would jolt higher. So I thought awesome. that was super cool. Just the image in my head, like an 11 year old boy, like suspended 250 feet <laughs> by one hand on a broom that's trying to shake him off. Like that's, that was pretty cool. Imagine how freaked out you'd be. <laughs> like that's like hanging off a roller coaster, man. For your life. Yeah, dude, exactly. So I just, uh, that was something cool. And then obviously the way he catches it with his mouth is, is hilarious. <laughs> uh, and I actually wrote down the final score of that first match that we see is Quidditch. Gryffindor won 170 to 60 against Slytherin. That's awesome. Um, now, page 192 is when Hagrid slips up for the first time when he talks about Fluffy and Nicholas Flamel. So now we've got like, like they are starting to, put the pieces together about what's been going on. Cause this entire time they know like when they first ran into fluffy, like Hermione said, Hey, it's guarding something. It's under a trap door. And mm -hmm. they never really thought about it. And then like, obviously with the daily prophet saying like someone tried to break into that vault and steal that the wheels start turning. And then now Hagrid so something up. Now they've got a name. Now they've got a clue that they are going to be using, trying to figure out what exactly is there. Cause remember that bloody mangled leg is what Harry saw. And so he's like, well, Snape's trying to get past the dog. So Snape's trying to see whatever it is. Now he's interested and wants to know because like and Snape hate each other and he thinks, you know, Snape's doing some dirty stuff. So yeah. now we've got clues. Nicholas Flamel. Big, uh, big moment there. Then page 194, my favorite moment. Guys, I know we're probably going to do a top five favorite characters of all time at the very end of this series when we talk about Deathly Hallows and finish up with Harry Potter. But I, I always, like, I'm going to tell you right now, my favorite character of all time in the Harry Potter universe is Fred Weasley. I relate to him very, very well, like prankster, jokester, like running around just trying to have fun. And, and uh, I think it's, um, it's someone that uh, 
I, I enjoy immensely. And so the one page 194, this is hilarious. Fred and George were punished for bewitching snowballs to follow Quirrell and bounce off the back of his turban. So if you guys <laughs> that think was about awesome. that, if think about this realistically here, <laughs> you know what's underneath uh, Professor Quirrell's turban. So basically Fred and George were pelting snowballs at Voldemort's face. <laughs> like at the darkest wizard of all time. Imagine him being under the turban, be like, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and even worse, they're hard snowballs because they're bouncing off. Like they can't yeah. even smash properly. So he's basically getting hit in the face with bouncing rocks. Dude, it's hilarious. And he's just got to sit there and take it. So Fred and George, <laughs> they're, those are my boys, but Fred specifically. He's like, he's like the leader of the two, I would say. And that's why I like him. The <laughs> troublemakers, I would consider myself a little bit of a funny troublemaker. So uh, <laughs> love that. Then I go into page 201 when Harry receives the invisibility cloak. That's a huge moment there because that invisibility cloak like really changes the game for them in Hogwarts, not only throughout this book, for throughout the entire series. That invisibility cloak comes in big at least once every single book. <laughs> so... Huge yeah. moment there. Uh, in page 219, we find out Nicholas Flamel, he is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. What's the Sorcerer's Stone do? I guess I could probably say it for interesting facts, but you know, it's not that big of a deal. It produces the elixir of life, which renders the drinker immortal as long as they've got a steady influx of the elixir of life. And also it changes any metal into pure gold. So uh, as rich yeah. as you want to be and live as long as you want, anything that uh, the human would like that's like the two main things humans want right and Dumbledore has a cool quote at the end of the book about that that I'll mention but um, cool there then page 224 this is the uh, second Quidditch match where they play Hufflepuff and where the one I have what I had written down here it has nothing to do with the Quidditch game it has to do with the brawl in the stands when Ron and Neville brawl with Crab, Goyle and Malfoy I thought that was dope. You know, like Ron yeah. ended up giving Malfoy a black guy, like Crab and Goyle, not Neville unconscious. But dude, they just like straight up forgot the wands <laughs> on the side and just scrapped right in the damn bleachers of the Quidditch game, uh, the second one. <laughs> so I um, thought that was pretty cool. And so, yeah, Harry actually caught the snitch in page 224. It says he caught it in what must have been record time uh, mm -hmm. because no one could ever remember the snitch being caught so fast. And they ended up winning that one. And they ended up taking the lead in the house points because when you win the Quidditch matches, like the house points, you uh, you gain house points. So then on page 227, again, my boys, Fred and George, causing problems, stealing cakes from the kitchen. There, that's my boys. <laughs> uh, page 233, Hagrid has a black, and, a black dragon egg he's trying to hatch. So we don't know what it is yet, but uh, it's, it's hilarious because Hagrid – he knows it's a Norwegian Ridgeback egg because of books he took out from the library. And remember that Harry and Ron and Hermione saw him taking those books and Ron's like looking there and talks about how like, and I'll talk about this in an interesting facts about the, the illegality of dragon breeding. But uh, yeah, 233, <laughs> he's got a black dragon egg he's trying to hatch. Page 235, Norbert hatches. Norbert was the first dragon that we come across in Harry Potter. They've been referenced before, like, when they went to Gringotts, they said, you know, so they, there's dragons that are protecting like the vaults down there. And they've, so they've been referenced, but this is the one that first makes an introduction as itself. And the Nor and just think about it. Norwegian Ridgeback is such a cool name for a, a dragon. Norwegian oh, yeah. Ridgeback. Well, I'm not messing with that creature. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. That's, that's that sounds awesome. awesome. Yeah. So, and, but then the crazy part is, is Malfoy actually saw that happen. And now that's a big problem because he's got something he's holding over their head, like to get everyone in trouble. So they've got to figure out how to get Norbert gone. And so. Uh, I just picture, sorry, not to interrupt yeah, you. No. I just picture a bunch of Vikings, like trying to fight this massive Norwegian full grown Ridgeback, <laughs> like in ancient times. And yeah, it's just like gladiating. <laughs> He's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Dude, for real. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so after they after like they have to get Norbert gone, that's like the biggest thing you take away from there. Page two forty six. Harry actually hears Quir uh, Professor Quirrell in a room talking to someone, and like he looks like sounds like he's broken down. He says, "All right, all right," and like kind of gives in. So Harry thinks that's Snape that broke him down, 
But that's actually wrong. It wasn't Snape in that room with Quirrell. We find out later on what actually happened. Because remember, when he left that room, it said his turban was hanging loosely. So uh, that was a big moment. Um, page 248, when they're going down to serve their detention for being caught trying to get Norbert <laughs> on. Uh, Filch, like Professor Filch, uh, good old freaking Walder Frey himself. <laughs> uh, Professor <laughs> Walder Frey. What's his name? The caretaker? No, Hagrid's the caretaker. What did they call him? I forget his exact like title, but no, he's a caretaker, right? He's a caretaker of the castle. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, what he is. Yeah, because yeah, um, Hagrid was keeper like, of keys. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, 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 <laughs> so so Philip's the caretaker. He talks about the old punishments, and he's so happy about it. He's like, I keep the oil, the uh, the chains well oiled <laughs> in case they're ever needed again. Like, what a weirdo, man. <laughs> Let's talk about this too. By the way, like every role that guy plays. The actor that plays him, he's always played a creep. Like, I don't know why. Every role that a guy <laughs> wants to play, yeah, he plays like a creep character for some reason. Because he's really good. He's known for Mr. Filch and Walter Frey. Like, two of the biggest creeps in the world, if like, you ask me. One, people like everyone hates. Like, no one likes them. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. Uh. And we learned, and the cool, and I'm actually glad you brought that up because that's going to be something for a foreshadow later on. But there's a reason why Phil hates students. Um, I don't want to mm-hmm. give it up, but uh, yeah. So it's not just because like he's just an angry, well, he is an angry old man, but like there's a reason why specifically he doesn't like students. And it's because I, I can't give it up yet. So <laughs> I think that's in chamber. Later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's chamber, but yeah. That, uh, yeah. Page 252, centaurs are introduced, which is awesome because they are super intellectual creatures. And I have something for foreshadowed events, which is big and interesting facts on these. So I don't want to go too far into the centaurs here because what I have is pretty mind blowing for people who maybe didn't think this far ahead of it or maybe just read past this uh, little section. But uh, Centaurs are introduced. Ronin's the first one, even though Ferenz is the most helpful and the one that comes up most. Ronin's actually the first centaur that's introduced to us. Uh, then Bane after him, and then Ferenz when Ferenz saves Harry. But uh, they, they kept repeating a phrase, Mars is bright tonight. And that's important because when we talk about foreshadowed events, I'm going to get into that in heavy detail. But for now, yep. talking about the, uh, the big moments, page 256, the hooded creature drinking the unicorn's blood you don't know what it is yet but like these unicorns they they look so beautiful especially the way they made them look i'll say this in the movie like silvery shimmery like they look like the epitome of innocence and like how its blood was just so pure as well and we know why it drinks the blood right because friends ends up telling us you know uh it it keeps it sustains life you know, you'll have a cursed life and a half life but it will keep you alive and that's when we learn for the first time Voldemort's still alive, right? You don't know any point up until this time, reading it for the very first time, that Voldemort has anything to do with anything. So they, it's been talked about how his powers are broken, but he was out there buying his time, trying to come back to power. That was something that was talked about in the beginning by Hagrid. But this is the first time you realize, oh crap, Voldemort's here. Like he's like, not, not only is he alive and trying to come back to power, he's right at the school. So mm-hmm. that was huge. Uh, and that's how I said page 259 uh, after friends saves Harry's life friends helps Harry piece together that Voldemort was the one drinking the unicorn blood and that he wants the stone to come back to full strength and power so now instead of Harry thinking Snape wants to steal a stone for himself he realizes oh shit uh, they want to he Snape wants to steal the stone for Voldemort which Harry is mistaken but in his mind this is why everything comes so important right now and this ramps up all the big moments that are about to happen here pretty much in a row because the next thing that happens in page 268 Dumbledore is gone they go to see Dumbledore and McGonagall tells him like he received an urgent letter from the ministry and he's gonna be gone for tonight what a better time to strike the castle when you know how to get past all of the enchantments and you know that the the greatest sorcerer of all time is not gonna be there what what a better time right so also Dumbledore getting tricked by a letter 
Like, really, bro? <laughs> oh, I've got some issues with Dumbledore that I'll get into later. But <laughs> anyways, uh, page 271. I love this part. I'm actually going to read it from the book. Uh, just because, like, the main thing I took away from it, they are best friends. And they were all in it together. So this is what he actually said. Where is it? All righty. So here he goes. Uh uh, I'll, I'll use the invisibility cloak. It's lucky I got it back in time. And Ron says, but will it cover all three of us? And Harry says, all three of us? And Ron replies, oh, come off it. You don't think we'd let you go alone? And Hermione says, of course not. How do you think you'd get to the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. <laughs> but if we, get, if we get caught, you guys will be expelled too. And Hermione replies, not if I can help it. Flivick told me in secret that I got 112% on his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. So I just thought that was really great because they could have let Harry go on his own and try to fight this thing off and do whatever. But straight up, they're in it together. They are the best, three best friends that anyone could have in the words of the hangover. <laughs> uh, oh, so most definitely. Like they, that, that was a true test of friendship. They're like, listen, you might die, but we're going to die with you. Ride or die is for life. Um, <laughs> And then I wrote on page 273, they petrific totalist Neville's ass. <laughs> they, they, uh, and this is <laughs> the third spell with words that was used. So again, the first one, Alohomora unlocks doors. The second one, uh, it would Guardian Levi oh, when Guardian Leviosa that levitates objects. And this last one here, petrific totalis, which is a full body bind. Now we hear about the leg locking curse, but we don't know the words and how that's performed in the spell. But these are the three that we get the actual words for in the spell and we see them performed in real time. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they put Fluff on page 275, they put Fluffy to sleep with the flute. They drop down, they fire Devil Snare, like Hermione gets out of it, gets to the wall, puts some fire on Devil Snare, gets them out of there, they get to the wall. This is the big differences that we'll talk about next week. There's some huge differences that go on during this entire time. But then also on page 280, they have to fly around and get the key from mm -hmm. the, uh, the, to get into the next room. So they get through the trap door, play the flute. They get down there. Devil Snare is waiting. Hermione realizes, hey, fire is going to take it out. Boom. She gets them past that. They go into the room with the keys. Harry's strength is flying. Harry gets the key. They go into the next room. It's the chess set. Ron's strength. And Ron kicks the their their ass the best game of wizard chess the hogwarts that was awesome. seen, right yeah. and then that was awesome so ron actually sacrifices himself so harry can checkmate the king and that brings him on into the next room which was the troll knocked out unconscious so they actually got to move right on to the next one which was the uh potion riddle uh yep. room which was really cool uh so <clears throat> this is something that i wanted i'm gonna break this down in quick detail Fluffy came from Hagrid. Devil Snare came from Professor Sprout. The uh, Professor Flitwick charmed the keys. Uh, Professor McGonagall transfigured the chess set. Professor Quirrell made the troll, like they had the troll guarding. Snape was the potion, uh, the potion riddle. And then obviously the mirror of Erised, which I'll go into an interesting fact. Yeah, on. this is going to be cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally left that off my hero moments because I want to go into that in interesting facts. I did that on purpose. Awesome. Um, but yeah, so then obviously the mirror of said was Dumbledore. So those seven, seven's a very magical number and it's come up many, many times. And again, another seven here. And also I think it's important to point out that each of these trials played to one of the three best friends strengths, right? So the first one, devil snare with fire on it, they all had to help because Hermione kind of, again, she lost her composure in the face of things. She's like, she's like, uh, they like cool damn places. And then she goes, then uh, Ron says, well, set it on fire. And then she's like, well, I don't have wood. And then she's like, are you a witch or not? Like, like literally like, <laughs> like Hermione, are you a witch or not? It's like, she, again, like I said, in the movie, they overblow her importance. But in the book, she's like, she's not that like, as of right now, she's kind of silly. Um, so then they get past that part there. Then they get into the part where, they've got to fly around the keys. That's Harry's strength, right? Harry is a great Quidditch player, he's a seeker. And then the next one, the next room, uh, the chess set, Ron all the way through the book was great at chess, beating everyone in chess. So that played to Ron's strength. 
Then the next room, obviously, it was just like basically a free pass because the troll was already knocked out. And then they played a Hermione specific strength, which is logic, which was the potion riddle. So every room to get to the Sorcerer's Stone played to a strength of one of these three characters. And I think that's something people overlook and it's really cool. But Symbolism of three, just throwing it out there. Three, seven, magical numbers, man. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, and so on page 288, we find out that it was Quirrell all along and Snape was actually trying to help him. Uh, you know, that was a huge, like we find out that uh, Harry's, ma or Harry's dad went to school with Snape and that's why Snape hates him is because he went to school with Harry's dad. But big moment there is when we find out it was Quirrell, like it was like a ta-da moment. So if you read it for the first time, you're like, oh, shoot, what the heck? And then page 293, we actually get to see Voldemort for the first time. He unwraps the turban, and we see that it had glowing red eyes, like, nost like slits for nostrils. Like, 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 it was really creepy. <laughs> but I thought in the book, he was really cool described. I thought in Sorcerer's Stone, too. Sorcerer's Stone, they did really well. I, I think it was... A little bit later on could have been a little bit more towards how the book described but that was that was a, a cool moment so props on that not to take away your thunder i just wanted to chime in let you know was, not at all man no it was like again these are just like favorite moments of us ones that stuck out right these the, the details are really going to come in between like the foreshadowed events and the interesting facts and and uh plot holes but in terms of big moments, what's bigger than Voldemort returning for the first time, right? You see him on the back of, like, the, he's been in the turban this entire time. Keep in mind, in the Leaky Cauldron, uh, Professor Quirrell didn't have the turban. He had the turban at the feast. So something happened in between there and there, which I'll talk about in our, in our other sections. But, yeah, page 293, Voldemort on the back of Quirrell's head, and we learn what he's become. He's like a shadow of his form of self. He, he's like vapor, and he, can only, he can't take physical form himself, right? So thought that was cool so i won't go into what happens in terms of how that battle goes just yet i'll probably let chase tackle that but what i'll go to is afterwards is page 297 dumbledore has a really cool quote and i love it because they talk about like you know he ends up in the hospital wing after that confrontation with voldemort he's okay dumbledore is there he's starting to ask questions they realize like the stone was he got there in time Dumbledore got to, to Harry in time before Harry died. Harry is more worried about Voldemort getting the stone, which is crazy. He's got no regard for his own life. <laughs> but um, <laughs> one of the greatest things, because like then Harry started to feel bad for Nicholas Flamel. He's like, oh, so him and his wife are going to die. And Dumbledore says this quote, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So I thought that was pretty awesome. There was also another one too. Like, I actually want to read this in its entirety. There was a really cool paragraph here. Um, where is it? Yes. So Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. And he says, to one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible. But to Nicholas and Perinelli, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, Death is but the next great adventure. You know, the stone was not really such a wonderful thing. As much money and life as you could want, the two most things humans want would, that, that most humans would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worse for them. So like, that's awesome. I thought that was a really cool thing because it's true, you know, humans do yeah. have a knack for choosing things that are not great for us. Um, and in page 299, we learn the power of love and how important that plays a role into this entire series. Uh, page 299, we learn that Dumbledore actually is the one that gave Harry the invisibility cloak. Obviously, we've all probably deduced it before at that point, but we actually get him saying that he gave it because it belonged to his father, left it in his, his father left it in Dumbledore's possession. Dumbledore gave it to Harry. Page 304, Hagrid gives Harry a photo album of his parents. That's a heartwarming, touching moment. Um, then page 306, Dumbledore awarding the points. And the only ones I, the only one I wrote down is Dumbledore awarding Neville 10 points, which won the, won the house cup for Gryffindor. Neville yeah. is the one that won the house cup for Gryffindor, not Hermione, not Harry, not Ron. Neville is the one that won the house cup for the first time in seven years for Gryffindor. And then, uh, page 309, I just wrote down that Harry's going to mess with Dudley because Dudley doesn't know that he's not allowed to use magic outside of school, but 
those are my big favorite moments yeah. that stuck out to me in quick bullet point fashion. I will turn it over to you, my man, Chase, and then we'll get into our foreshadowed events, plot holes, top five, and interesting facts. Yeah, man. No, that was good stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, just kind of starting off here, uh, the biggest one, I guess I really loved uh, when they actually arrived, like when they arrived on the boats in the film, I thought that was really cool. Like I, I um, especially the way, I, I gotta say this, this is why I wanted to bring up the film for this part too. Cause I thought that whole scene, like how creative was that? Like, yeah, that's how that it was done in the books too. But just to even film that, and that was a very bold move by the director to do that. And I still remember as a kid, before the movie came out, like that was on the poster. And everyone was sitting there thinking like, oh man, <clears throat> here it comes. Sorry, choked up on my malice over here. <laughs> yeah, uh, malice in the chalice, good stuff. Um. But yeah, I remember thinking like, wow, I, I can't wait till they get to Hogwarts. Like, this is when it's going down. So that was one of my favorite moments. Um, also, when they get to Hogwarts, I got to say, the guy that played Draco, I thought he was phenomenal. I thought he was fantastic. I just hate him for sure, yeah. Did, did it so well. Oh, can't stand him, but he was just like Draco in the books. Like He was just like that kind of a i hate to use his word but an ass <laughs> that's really what he was and uh remember he looks at ron after uh you know neville's dropped his toad this is in the film of course on top of mcgonagall and mcgonagall's just sitting there staring and everyone's all intimidated <laughs> he was typical mouth boy after ron speaks up like trying to like stand up for harry <clears throat> oh Hand me down robe. I don't even have to ask you who you must be. You must be a Weasley. <laughs> like instantly. Because like, and then we're talking, I think I keep saying we're talking about differences, but like that never happened in the books either. Like, yeah, it never that, did. That was something, like, their first confrontation came on the train and in the movie yeah. it happened right there. So weird stuff. And I just, he reminded me of, uh, what's your from New York? I don't know how like mob guys are in New York, but I could totally see Malfoy if this was 40 years later, that's crab, that's Goyle. <laughs> like that was, it felt like that guy in the fourth grade that thought he was like, he was the guy <laughs> like on the recess ground. Yeah. So I thought, I thought it was cool. Um, one thing I brought up to you yesterday, which you hear it here on the podcast first. So I don't want anyone stealing Jay Nelly and I's thunder uh, when they probably wind up doing this because I thought this was really cool. So in the film, uh, this is, so when they walk in right before they start to get sorted. So Hermione uh, makes a quote and looks up into the ceiling and you saw how it was like the night sky as you kind of walked into that room. And um, Hermione says, uh, basically what she says is she says, it's bewitched to look like the night sky. I read about it in Hogwarts, A History of Magic. And so I thought that would be really cool. It's, with all the projections and stuff they have going on, even on the rides, if you walked into the castle and you saw that, or even the candles that were in the film that were like levitating, if they had a projection of that, it would really set the atmosphere. And I gotta say, it would be really cool, which I don't know why they don't do this. They have all the rights to have a Hogwarts Horror Nights house. If you had either the castle that was like, almost like it was set up like the Battle of Hogwarts, but it had been overtaken and you had the trolls and everything in there, similar to how we had you know, uh, Winterfell and Game of Thrones, but after it was taken over. Um, or if you even did like the Forbidden Forest, and of course you have the Cenotars there, but maybe you have, you know, somewhere in there, Quirrell's like drinking the unicorn blood and you have all the Cenotars or the spiders from who we'll talk about later in the future. I thought that'd be really cool. So you hear it here on the podcast first. So when Universal goes stealing our thunder, we charge by the hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, after that, 
I thought uh, the sorting hat scene, of course, was really cool, um, which uh, I thought that was a great point you made about the songs, which we'll go into differences later, but that was really cool. Funny, because uh, you were the one that thought of the songs. Usually I'm the song guy, so it was good stuff. Um, but yeah, and I loved how they were chosen into the different houses. You know, Harry was even sitting there debating, like, trying to tell him because we find out later reason why, um, you know, don't put me in Slytherin, not Slytherin. And, you know, he was like, oh, but you'll be great in the Slytherin. <laughs> they will definitely make great things out of you. And he was just like, no. Um, so I thought it was really cool. One thing I do want to say. So I actually looked this up and we were talking about it last night. And this goes into the houses. So that's why I'm actually going to bring this up now. So it's really hard to see at the moment. Um, for where the visuals are. Uh, but if you look up like a Hogwarts banner, so actually underneath this visual here, what it says is it says Draco Dormians and Nuquam Calandis, or I guess that's how you would pronounce it. Jay Nelly is usually better at the pronunciation, but the actual words underneath the Hogwarts banner, what that means is don't tickle a sleeping dragon. <laughs> so I thought that was really cool. Really Not cool. Like that. super important, but cool. Oh, no, that's great. No, that's a good one. I like that. It's favorite moments, man. That, that's favorite something. moments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was really cool. Also, uh, we were talking about this yesterday when they said Caprichus uh, Draconis. Um, so what that means is dragon head. So it, it's kind of cool. You see all these kind of hidden meanings about dragons just like you kind of saw from before when they went over to Gringotts, you know, you saw like kind of that foreshadowing of what's lying underneath, uh, which comes up a big moment later. So, which we're all big, we're both big dragons people. I mean, we got Felix, <laughs> is our dragon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I like the fact you mentioned the dream uh, and, and Coral's turban and stuff later on. That was really cool. Um, Next thing I had uh, was, so it's chapter eight, the potions master. You know, I'm a big Snape fan. It's very funny. Jay Nelly and I, my two top favorite are usually the ones he hates. And the <laughs> ones he ranks at the top, I can't stand. As you've seen, which most of y'all have been following us since the beginning of the show. As you've seen, our rankings are usually drastically <laughs> just to see like what our both our top fives are today for magical creatures i'm interested to see how that changed like how different that is for both of us too <laughs> oh it's going to be fantastic <laughs> it's going to be great um and and one thing i did want to say right before then before you go into that who is it this was so funny in the film i thought it, it wasn't important at all but it was a funny part <clears throat> that guy where you know his stuff always blows up in his face later on that we'll talk about but he was like my dad's a muggle. My mom's a witch. Shame. Bit of a nasty shock when he found out. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, what's his name? Jameis Finnegan. Oh, Jameis Finnegan. Shame. Yeah, he's great, man. Jameis with an S. Seamus Finnegan. Yeah. Seamus. Seamus Finnegan. You know, I'm the worst with names. <laughs> but yeah, he he is he was great. My dad's a muggle. <laughs> me mom's a witch. <laughs> I was like, okay. He reminded me of that person in a classroom who he's just talking to hear himself talk. And either the teacher or everyone around him is just sitting there like, oh, cool. <laughs> like, good stuff, buddy. <laughs> That's great. Um, so then they go into Snape's potions class, which is I I thought. I thought the actor that played Snape was phenomenal. Oh, he did phenomenal. He did great I thought, job. I thought it was great. And, um, you know, I always lift up my, my wands to uh, this guy because he passed away years ago, but he is fantastic, man. Um, but I did like this kind of monologue he has when he goes off on Harry in the classroom. He really reminded me of someone you would have kind of in high school that thought their job was more important than it was <laughs> when you walk into the classroom, like turn off your cell phones, like not gonna be dealing with it. And he said, there will be no foolish wand waving or silly incantations in this class. As such, I don't expect many of you to appreciate the subtile science and exact art that is potion making. Whatever those select few who possess the predisposition 
I can teach you how to bewitch the mind and ensnare the senses. I can tell you how to bottle fame, brew glory, and even put a stopper in death. Then again, maybe some of you have come to Hogwarts in possession of abilities so formidable that you feel confident enough to not pay attention. Mr. Potter, our new celebrity. Tell me what I would get if I added the roots of a spottle to an infusion of wormwood. You don't know? Let's try again. Where, Mr. Potter, would you look if I asked you to find a bezoar? What is the difference between monk seed and wolfsbane? Pity. Clearly, fame isn't everything, is it, Mr. Potter? And remember, Hermione, my other favorite, is waving her hand. And then Harry goes, clearly, Hermione knows. It seems a pity not to ask her. Silence. Put your hand down, you silly girl. <laughs> For your information, Mr. Potter, a spottle and wormwood make a sleeping potion so powerful it is known as the drought of the living dead. A bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat and will save you from the most poisons. As for monkswood and wolfbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name aconite. Well, why aren't you all copying this down? <laughs> like, I just thought it was great. It reminded me of that high school teacher that basically, like, didn't do anything else with their life. So they wanted to put such an emphasis on the rules and being in demand of power in this one little class that everyone's like, wow, I got this class this semester. So I just thought the acting was great in that moment so yeah, some people might think it was annoying another big difference too because i think i'm assuming you took that quote from the movie it seems like most yeah. posts are from the movie yeah right? that was film yeah, straight yeah like, film straight yeah film. interesting because like there's so, was, yeah. there are so many differences between the book and the movie it's really it's really funny but yeah, it, yeah. i like it too because like it's funny we never we never consult each other on like what we're gonna do and it <laughs> always ends up just working out that we both cover different stuff because like all my stuff was like 98 percent book and yours is like mostly film so it's like giving different perspectives it's kind of interesting oh it's always great and that's what we always talk about on this show especially for y'all that's always followed us you know you have josh that's like all straight facts and then i just come out of left field and i'm like i hope you've been paying attention <laughs> oh yes ah oh, so great so next thing i really had there um uh, i i did have to remember all like you said i thought that was really cool um i'll save uh, a lot of the quidditch stuff quidditch stuff for interesting facts but um you know i thought it was cool in the book uh it, it kind of took me back to a time where like if you're almost in trouble with your parents and you're not sure what they're going to do and then it turns out you know that wasn't what was happening at all when he was following McGonagall all the way over to uh, Oliver Wood who is in Quirrell's class and uh she's like I found you a seeker <laughs> like she, McGonagall was so thrilled and that it I'll just made you. me to me that's something so simple and I'm sorry I'm gonna put this difference in today because that's something that, that really did bug me. It's something so simple that you could have literally just did it the right way and it wouldn't have changed anything. In the book, mm -hmm. McGonagall pulled Wood out of Professor Flitwick's class. And in the movie, yeah. it was out of Professor Quirrell's class. Yeah, like, yeah. what's the difference? Like, why don't you not just follow the, what you're like? It's the, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, that's so true. Yeah, Flitwick. And, and it's not like they didn't go to Flitwick's class. They know. Like, that's a big part in the movie, too. So yeah, um, no, I 100% with you on there. I, I, I thought it was so true. Wouldn't change anything budget-wise, you know what I mean? Like it, you just put someone else's face in there. Like Literally, <laughs> that's all you had to do. Like, like that's all you had to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, even worse, like it's not like they really even showed Quirrell. Oh. No. Like he didn't even have, like you didn't even have to show Flitwick. Like you could have showed him like walking out and barely in the corner. It's not like he yeah. does it. Um, but uh, so um, one thing I thought was really cool, which you know we're gonna save the differences for next week. But like one thing they hundred percent omitted was the duel at midnight, yep. 
with Malfoy. And I, I love Ron's quote here because it's so typical, Ron. It reminded me of like, you know, say you're playing video games with your boys or something and you're working on trying to beat this level or get past this guy. <laughs> like he has no idea how to do it. So he's telling you all these things and it makes no point. So Ron is preparing Harry like to fight Malfoy in this like midnight duel. And I love what Ron says. Um, and he jumps in for a minute to uh, be what's called a second. Um, and then Harry goes, what's a second? A second to take over if you die. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So he goes, oh, typical Ron. Um, he goes, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most Malfoy will be able to do is send sparks to each other. Neither of you know enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyways. But one thing I loved about it, though, was, like, the whole day, it was describing how he was just teaching him how to dodge curses because he couldn't, he didn't know how to block them. Like, <laughs> what a, yeah. <laughs> like, what a waste of time. Like, that's a... The typical, like, best friend that doesn't know how to do it. And he's like, oh, don't worry, man. I got you on this. Well, no. You're just going to have to learn how to dodge those because I don't know how to block that. Like, that's not going to help you. Yep. Um, so I thought that was great. And the the curse was Curse of the Bogies, which I did look up. That actually gives the person an uncontrollable cold <laughs> for a time being, which is, like, I thought that was cool because it was – Typical of like this level, like an 11 year old level for a duel of that caliber. Like, I'm not going to kill you, but you're going to have a cold for a while. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's great. Um, and Hermione, this uh, quote was actually in the books here. Um, and this was uh, after, you know, Malfoy uh, doesn't show up to the duel. And uh, Hermione and Ron at this point, um, see fluffy that we learned is fluffy the three-headed dog guarding the trap door <laughs> and hermione this is actually this is what i was talking about like the dialogue in some parts are very close to the film because this is out of the book which this is very close to the film well i hope you're pleased with yourselves we could have all been killed or worse expelled now if you don't mind I'm going to bed. <laughs> it's so great. I loved it. And it was um, typical Hermione Granger. So that really stood out to me. Um, and then, you know, of course, just like you were saying, they suspect, you know, um, Fluffy and they go, uh, is guarding the trap door there. And then chapter 10, Halloween. Um, I thought it was really cool when they owl you know, I'm an owl guy, man. It's oh, all about the yeah. owls. But he dropped off the Nimbus 2000. So I thought that was really cool. And in the film, you know, McGonagall is just kind of sitting there, like, smiling. So I thought it was really cool. Um, I'll bring up this later because uh, I got a lot of really cool information on this. But, um, you know, in the book, they describe, you know, Quidditch is seven on seven um, with three chasers. And then, of course, you know, um, three are chasers. So it's, it just kind of reminded me. And then you have the two keepers and the two beaters. It just really, just like you well, were There's saying, only one keeper on a team. There's three chasers, two beaters, one keeper, and one seeker. Yeah, sorry. One keeper, one seeker. But, like, really, it just reminded me, of just like you were saying, like how we watch football or other sports watch soccer – like, how creative was that for J.K. Rowling to invent something like this? And this is what really sets this franchise apart. Because in other fantasy franchises, if, even if you go to Game of Thrones or something, I don't recall Game of Thrones like they're playing the sport. Yep. Like, that's, that's so cool. So I just thought that was really cool. I'll save a lot of that information for interesting facts. But just the fact Quidditch was there was really cool. Um, another one. <laughs> This is my favorite uh, Hermione Granger moment, <laughs> which even goes into, what's his name? The guy that the stuff blew up in his face. Seamus? Seamus, yeah. So right before here, though. So in class, when Hermione's like, swish and flick. And 
We'll go into differences later. Um, because there is a difference here. That's just a minor difference here in the book. In the book, she just says Leviosa, but in the film, so like in the in the book, you know, Ron's like Wingardium Leviosa. He's like snapping the wand. And this is even in the film, you know. And Hermione says, You're saying it wrong. It's Wingardium Leviosa make the gar nice and long and that's i gotta say this because this is a difference between the book and the movie which will leave differences for later but in the film you know i thought it was funny because you could almost make like a t-rex joke or something because she says it's leviosa not leviosar <laughs> oh it's so great and ron is just like and uh he goes you do it then if you're so clever and she just looks at it and goes Wingardium Leviosa. And of course she has the little wand and it's just like flicking it. And Professor Flitwick has like just found the greatest student of all time. It's like, oh, very good, Miss Granger. Very good. See, we can all be like Miss Granger. And Ron is just sitting there like, it just reminded me of the person that never studies and gets an A. And you're like, wow, I worked my butt off. And I barely pulled off a B <laughs> in this class. So I thought that was great. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, like you were saying, um, just like you were saying, that uh, big moment where, you know, Ron was even saying, you know, they brought up she was crying in the bathroom all day. And this really, just like you said, uh, not reiterating any of your words, but the minute the troll came in, and they rescued Hermione from that troll. That's what bonded those three together from that point. And I think Hermione, this is why I love her so much, because at that point, <clears throat> it's almost like at that point, her pompousness falls off. Like she's, she's still Hermione, but at the same time, she's not near as I'm so much better than you at this point. She's kind of brought back down to everyone's level. I and, agree. Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was cool how Ron, you know, he used Wingardium Leviosa. And, like, it stopped the club and, like, hit him on the head. And then the troll bogeys I thought was pretty funny for the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> You know, Quidditch, I thought it was cool that the season began in November because that reminded me of just, like, very similar. It was almost like if you could watch Quidditch season, that's right when, like, hockey season and football and all that is, like, in its prime. So it's, like, their big sport is when our big sports are. Like, you know they're going to – like, school is going. Like, they're ready for this. Um, and then, you know, you have Harry that plays – you know, uh, Gryffindor versus Slytherin in that match. And um, I'll bring this up uh, later on, uh, but a lot of people don't know, which is really cool. Uh, I'll bring this up in interesting facts later on, but Quidditch, um, it can go on for a very long time, which I'll bring up later on. But I thought, yeah, I thought it was cool. Um, and then, you know, just like you said, you know, uh, you know, they see Snape's leg and that he was bewitching, at least so they think, bewitching the broomstick. Um, in the book, you know, remember when she shoots the flames, it's blue flames. Yeah. Which was cool. Like, the, that's what I loved about the book so much. The book is so, it's simple writing for like a child. But it's detailed to the point. It gets its point across. It's descriptive, yeah. Very descriptive, yeah. Um, and so, and, and you know, so I thought that was really cool. Christmas at Hogwarts. I'm going to let you go into a lot of this. This is your big moment later. Um, Mirror of Eraset was awesome. So that's all I'll say about that because I'm going to let you take that later. Um, and of course, there were differences on that that we'll talk about next week. But uh, I thought, you know, the um, invisibility cloak was awesome. In the film, I thought they did really well, which that's just a quick uh, camera trick you can do. But I remember watching that 
uh, in theaters and I was like, oh man, like finally the invisibility cloak is here. That was that moment you were like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like now it's going down. Just like, you know, GDFR, Flow Rider. It's going down for real. <laughs> yeah, that was that moment. And um, so, you know, uh, after I told you, uh, the Mirror of Aerosette was a big one for me, and I'll, I'll let you talk about that. Um, do you want to say... after that see it, it we're kind of like nicholas flamel is what i was going to say in the book another little difference which i hate bringing up this right now but you know ron and them they kind of hear about nicholas flamel through the wizard cards harry and ron but at this point i thought it was cool hermione uh finds out about nicholas flamel in the film it was from like a book she read um, whereas it was different a little bit in the, in the book, but I did like, um, you know, in the film, as far as that goes, uh, I want to read this quote real quick. Cause I, I thought it was cool. Um, but well, in the book, it's, it's pretty much the same, I would say, but she just says the ancient stuff, it says the ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the sorcerer's stone a legendary substance with astonishing powers the stone will transform any metal into pure gold like you're saying it also produces the elixir of life which will make the drinker immortal there have been many reports of the sorcerer's stone over the centuries but the only stone currently in existence belongs to nicholas flamel the noted alchemist and opera uh, lover uh, mr flamel who celebrated the 665th birthday imagine that's insane last year enjoys a quiet life in Devon with his wife, uh, Pernelli, 658. So that was like in the book, you read that like on a newspaper, remember? Whereas like in the film, like Hermione says basically that after pulling a book out of the library. Um, yeah, because that's when Hermione uh, then says, you know, uh, the dog must be guarding the Flamel Sorcerer's Stone. I bet he asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him because they're friends and he knew someone was after that. That's why he wanted the stone moved to Gringotts. Um, but I just thought that was like a really big moment, uh, which was really cool. Um, you know, like you said, Harry wins the divisional rivalry. Uh, I When Harry won that match too, like it was like in the book. Remember, I feel like he was like, there was one where it was describing him diving, like to the point he was like about to hit the ground and then caught the snitch. Was that what, the one that was like record time? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So that really stood out to me there. Um, you know, the Forbidden Forest, like when he follows Snape, that was really awesome. Um, and then, you know, from that point, then we had, <laughs> that massive chapter that was basically omitted from the entire film, but I thought was really cool because in the book, you know, they go to the astronomy tower and they're helping get it. They're really helping Hagrid and getting Norbert to Charlie who like even meets him there. And that's just, we'll talk about that later, but, well, Charlie sent friends. Different. Charlie himself was still in Romania, yeah. but Charlie sent four friends to take him. Yeah. Yeah, like sent four friends. But like that whole point was different entirely. In oh, yeah, film, 100%. I would say. Um, so, and then at that point, I would say, I'm trying to go back and forth between the book and the film here. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see here. Because it's, it's pretty funny because you have all these notes on the book and then you look at the film and you're like, the film has like nothing <laughs> as far as notes. But um, yeah, so after, after that, I would say, then that's when, you know, they go through the trap door, like you were saying. Um, I thought the, the wing was cool. We'll talk about differences later on that. Um, but just like you said, I, th I thought that was cool 
after they took down, um, I don't want to say took down Fluffy, but sent Fluffy like to sleep with the flute and the harp was already there. I thought that was awesome uh, in a film wise for the harp. Um, but, you know, Harry got on the broomstick and really used his strength to get that key. And um, we'll talk about plot holes as far as a piece. There's a little piece of that I'll talk about later. That really goes more into the Forbidden Forest, but there is a little bit of a, a plot hole there. And then, you know, definitely this is different. The next one with the Devil's Snare. <laughs> Which I gotta say, like, I, I did love this iconic line, though. Because <clears throat> it's like, it's like they didn't even pick up the book for this part. It's like they have no idea how this even happened. I agree. But, which is funny, because now it's like a really iconic line, even for Universal, if you ride some of the rides. But Hermione goes, uh, remember, this was really cool, I thought, because Ron, like, she was trying to tell them to relax. Different in the books. We'll go into the difference later. But she was trying to tell them to relax because it's Devil's Snare. So relax. And Ron just wasn't relaxing. Like, would not stop. So she goes, stop moving back and forth. This is Devil's Snare. You have to relax. If you don't, it will only kill you faster. Ron, kill us faster. Oh, now I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, like Hermione relaxes and sinks down to the floor below, um, which a little bit different in the books. What? Um, and then, Ron, yeah, a lot different. We'll go into that next week. But um, <laughs> then Ron goes, now what are we going to do? And Hermione says, just relax. Hermione, where are you? Harry. Hermione says, do what I say. Trust me. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. And then Harry sinks to the floor. Hermione goes, he's not relaxing, is he? And Ron's like squirming, help, help, save me. And Harry goes, apparently not. Hermione, we've got to do something. What? I remember reading about something about this in Herbology. Devil's Snare. Devil's Snare. Deadly fun but we'll sulk in the sun. Different in the books. <laughs> That's if it hates sunlight. Lumo Salim, which I don't know where the hell they pulled that from, but it was awesome quote. Um, and then of course, you know, Hermione uses her strengths to fall on the floor. And then in the books, I thought it was really cool because, you know, she uses the fire, uh, which we'll go into next week. But that was uh, really cool. And... Um, just like you were saying earlier, you know, when Neville, um, Petrificus took Talus, that was a big one there. Um, that was a little bit before, but I figured I'd just bring it up since I just thought of that. But um, so at that point, you know, then they're falling into, they're going into um, what I would say in the movie wise, even in the book for me, is my favorite moment of this entire movie and book. Um, and that's the chess set. And maybe it's because the chess set room, I guess I would say. I mean, that's because I grew up playing chess. Uh, I grew up playing it with my grandfather all the time. So I could totally get this. I mean, I was as a kid, like, I'd be like, oh, man, it'd be so cool to, like, save the day from somebody by, like, beating them with Pokemon cards or some crap. So I just thought this was so cool. Um, it was epic. Um, and even just like from the film, uh, the dialogue, it was pretty similar to the book. It was. Um, and Hermione goes, Ron, you don't suppose this is going to be like real wizard's chess, do you? And then Ron goes, you there, D5. And then the pawn moves out to the front of the chessboard next to the other pawn. And keep in mind, the enemy is the white, and they have the uh, black figures, I would say. And then it takes out the sword, which was really cool for the film. And it just destroys it. And then Ron just goes, yes, Hermione. I think this is going to be exactly like Wizard's Chest. <laughs> so I thought it was awesome, man. Um, and then, of course, you have that big moment for Ron. He's really the hero of the day of this entire 
book and movie. I got to give it all to Ron because if they didn't, if Ron, they wouldn't have gone any farther if it wasn't for Ron. Like that would have been it. And the whole thing could have, the entire franchise could have been ruined if it wasn't for Ron. And uh, Ron says, you understand, Harry. And this is in the film dialogue, but it was very similar to the book. Um, he says, you understand, right, Harry? Once I make my move, the queen will take me. Then you're free to check the king. No, Ron, no. <laughs> Dialogue's ridiculous from Harry, but I wish they would have just cut him out, but I'll, I'll take it. They're 11-year-old kids. Hermione says, what is it? He's going to sacrifice himself. All right. Okay, Sherlock. Get it. <laughs> yeah. And then Hermione's like, no, you can't. There must be another way. But I do love this because it's so true. And it's, it's so true if you actually play the game of chess, um, even like on like a fantasy football team or any of that, um, or even in basketball or football, it's so true. Do you want to stop Snape from getting the stone or not? Harry, it's you that has to go on. I know it. Not me, not Hermione, you. And then he says, knight to H3. And then Hermione goes, Ron, Harry. Uh, and this is after like he's about to be hit. But it's, it's the whole point of he was saying, um, he says that big quote. And he was like, you have to make some sacrifices, is basically what he said. Um, which, of course, like the best part of it. Like, I, I didn't write that down. But he was like, you know, if you want to win, you have to make sacrifices here. And that he really takes command of this whole thing. He was almost like a quarterback um, calling all the shots here. And I thought it was so cool in the film, you know, and he was like, the queen's going to take me. And like, she comes over and this was visually, for the time, it was visually stunning, I would say for the time. And the queen like comes over with its fingers crossed and just turns to Ron. In the book, it's a little bit different, which we'll talk about that next week. But it like takes like the sword out and like shoves it through the night horse and like crushes it. And I kept thinking like, thank the Lord it hit the horse. Or if this was like a different reality than the book, like Ron could have been donezo. Well, the, um, he did get hit like in himself. Like he didn't have a, like he was, they were on their own chest pieces. He got clobbered upside the head in the book. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't like what I was saying is like it, the sword didn't go through him though. Yeah. Cause that, that was one of the differences we'll talk about next week. Yeah. Like, there was a sword in the movie where in the book, yeah. he just like hit him upside the head. Like a club. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he, yeah, this is when Ron says, this is actually out of the book too, where it was very close. And Ron says, we're nearly there. Let me think, let me think. And this is when the, it says the white queen turned her blank face toward him. Yes, said Ron softly. It's the only way I've got to be taken. And that's when they said, no. And this is out of the book. That Ron says, that's chess. You've got to make some sacrifices. I take one step forward and she'll take me. That leaves you free to checkmate the king, Harry. But do you want to stop Snape or not? And that was like that chilling moment where you're like, this is awesome. Like this guy has got this. And Ron says, look, if you don't hurry up, he'll already have the stone. There was no alternative. Ready? Here I go. Now don't hang around. Um, don't hang around. And so, and that was like, that was the biggest moment of the movie for me. Uh, and the, and the book as well. Cause that, that moment was, it was a little bit different, but it was still pretty similar. And you got to change some things. Um, as far as a movie goes sometimes. So I was, I was on board with it. Like I thought visually it was really cool. Um, the man with two faces, you know, we're getting into the last chapter here. I would say, you know, I thought it was cool. Uh, just like you were saying, you know, when he removed the turban of Voldemort in the chamber, like that was the moment, even in the film and the book, like we're all like, what? Like, I remember even looking at the book and you're like, the man with two faces, like, oh, wow, this must be like someone that's two-faced, like going behind their back. And then you're like, wow, no, this dude actually has two faces. Um, 
and like in the book too i found it much better than the film like the film was cool uh as far as like it, that battle you were saying i was going to talk about you know like remember he rushes harry and harry's like fingers are like burning him to death whereas like in the book you know when he touches his wrist like it burned but in the book you know like he like back towards him so like voldemort's face was facing him as it came forward so which i hate to bring up differences now but like that's one thing that really stood out to me it was definitely the book version that stood more out to me here and Coral said in the book, he does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep, keep a closer watch on me. And that's when you were realizing this wasn't Snape all along. This was Coral uh, talking to Voldemort. And, um, you know, that's when Harry, like you said, uh, I'll let you go into that in the um, Mira Vera set, but you know, he saw himself in the film, uh, put it in his pocket, um, you know, which he rightfully deserved. And, um, and you remember he was lying to Voldemort there. Uh, and, and it was just like really cool. Um, but then I do want to say like the fire, <laughs> Like, in the book, it was, like, the fire was, like, purple fire, right? Like, there was, like, some purple fire or something. Yes. I remember in the potion room where they had to go, like, it was, like, a purple fire ba uh, purple fire backwards to go back to the chessboard and a black fire to go forwards into, like, where the stone room was. And so yeah. Did that, yeah. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, because that really stood out to me, whereas just in the movie, it was just, like, the fire. <laughs> and then, like, Quirrell... That was another thing was in the in the movie like Coral and Voldemort like turn into ash all of a sudden. Yeah. I was like, what? That was weird. The, yeah, like totally changed the whole perspective of the book because in the book, remember he's like choking him. He's like choking him and then he wakes up in the hospital. Like it totally changed the perspective in the film because in the film, like why are you passing out? Like, why, why are you passing out for no reason now, Harry? Um, but, you know, and it, because it says, I even have it here just to prove it. It says, um, Harry sprang toward the flame door, but Voldemort screamed, seize him. And the next second, Harry felt Quirrell's hands close on his wrist. At once, a needle sharp pain seared across Harry's scar as Harry's head felt as though it was going to split in two. He yelled, struggling with all his might. As to his surprise, Quirrell let go of him. And then it says, um, basically, like, he was just, like, holding him until the point. Uh, it says, um, he kept touching Quirrell's face until it burned. And Harry reached up and burned his face. And then he woke up in the hospital wing, you know, with Dumbledore, like, three days later is basically what happened. Um, and then in the hospital, which was really cool, was just real yeah, quick on that, it. just to give like, because like I actually I have the book here, and so what yeah, happened, happened is like he, uh, like he ended up when Quirrell kind of mounted him and like was choking him, the mm -hmm. skin was burning his hands, and then so uh, he's like I can't touch him, and Voldemort tells him, well, fucking just kill him, like just yeah, kill him. So yeah. he just, like like to curse him and kill him, and that's when Harry put his hands on his face and burned it, and then he held on to the wrist. And like, like then, because remember, while, while this is happening, his pain in this scar was like blinding, and like he, like he yeah. was from the pain of the scar, and so he was trying to. Like he said, his whole world went black. So this is what um, he Go goes. Quirrell rolled off him, his face blistering too, and then Harry knew Quirrell couldn't touch his bare skin now without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep Quirrell uh, in enough pain to stop him from doing a curse. So Harry jumped to his feet caught Quirrell by the arm and hung on as tight as he could. Quirrell screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building. He couldn't see. He could only hear Quirrell's terrible shrieks and Voldemort yells of, kill him, kill him, and other voices, maybe in Harry's head, crying, Harry, Harry. And he felt Quirrell's arm wrenched from his grasp, and he knew all was lost and fell into blackness, down, down, down. So like yeah. he, he passed out because of the pain in his head while he was trying to hold it. Because remember, anytime Voldemort touches him, his scar like like erupts in pain. That's right. And so he was trying to hold on and like as long as he could before he passed out from the pain, just to you know do as much damage as he could to Quirrell. 
And that was really downplayed in the film. Remember he walked in the room and uh, what's his name? Daniel Radcliffe that plays Harry was just like, oh. <laughs> I was like, dude, like that completely yeah. misset the tone. But yeah, I love the book's version. I thought it was okay in the film, but the book um, did it wonders for me. And when he woke up in the hospital, that was that big moment where you found out, you know, like Harry and Ron were okay. And what happened was, and just like you said, I thought the riddle was cool, by the way, right before that. Um, because that's another difference we'll talk about. But um, when they're in the hospital, that's where you heard, you know, Harry and Ron were okay, and, you know, Hermione stayed with Ron, but then they came back up, and as they were going back back up, that's when they ran into Dumbledore, which, like, where the hell? Where was Dumbledore this whole time? Ministry, Patrick, with the he, got by a letter. He, got, he got fooled by a letter. <laughs> okay okay the one of the most powerful wizards of all time got fooled by a letter okay okay all right um anyways uh but that's when you know um i i did think this was a powerful moment because you were finding out you know look nicholas famel like unfortunately like see you later <laughs> alligator <laughs> like yeah, you're 665 done. years on earth he's fine <laughs> yeah he's fine he's good um and alvis said they have enough elixir stored to set their affairs in order and then yes they will die to one as young as you i'm sure it seems incredible but to nicholas and pernelli it really is like going to bed after a very very long day after all to the well-organized mind death is but the next great adventure you know the stone was really not so much a wonderful thing. As much money and life as you could want, the two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Here says, sir, I've been thinking, sir, even if the stone's gone, but I mean, you know who, and Albus goes, call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for this. Fear of a name increases the fear of the thing itself. Iconic line there, uh, straight from the book, actually. Um, and, and, you know, that's when you found out, you know, um, Voldemort, like, left Quirrell to die, and he's merciless, merciless. And Albus even says, out of the book, he is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for a new body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nonetheless, Harry, while you may only have delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. And, it, and if he is delayed again and again, why he may never return to power. But that just goes to show, like, we learn, like, he's not really gone like we're like oh man this guy is coming back uh so that really stood out to me um then just kind of as they're going back um remember hagrid kind of gives harry that photo album which was a little bit different in the film that's a difference we'll bring up next week but i thought that was really cool and you learned that you know hagrid kind of sold the secrets away from a game of cards because he really wanted that dragon egg. He didn't actually win the game like he bragged he did. Um, and then uh, you also learned that, you know, Albus in the book is the guy that dropped off the invisibility cloak, which was a big moment. Because um, you were wondering that the whole whole thing, whole time. And um, just like you were saying, you know, uh, I thought it was cool, you know, it was uh, Gryffindor won with 482 points with the House Cup, and, you know, 312 points is what Gryffindor had before. Hufflepuff was in second with 352 points, and Raven, uh, or sorry, uh, Hufflepuff was in third with 352 points. Ravenclaw, my house there, 426 points. Slytherin in first with 472 her points. Hermione won 50 points, Ron won 50 points, Harry won 60 points, and then Neville won 10 points, which gave him a total of 482. Um, the last thing I had uh, was 
just the epilogue in the book, which wasn't even in the film, which we'll talk about next week. But it was this little quote from Hermione because she actually gets to see the Dursleys. And yeah. she's like, yeah. And she's even like, okay, well, like, good luck with that. She says, uh, I hope you have a, a, a good holiday. And then it says, looking, in, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon shocked. Anyone could be so unpleasant. Like for Hermione to be um, like to see someone unpleasant, that's a big deal. So those were just the moments that uh, stuck out to me there. But love it, my man. Sweet, it's yeah, tough, man. Big moments down. Uh, we'll just hit our bullet points for foreshadowed events. Then we'll hit yeah. our bullet points of plot holes. Hit our magical creatures and finish off with some cool facts. So. Let's do it, man. Yeah, I'll run through my list of foreshadowed events. Page 11 in Sorcerer's Stone. The first time we learn people refuse to say Voldemort's name. That's something that comes to play very much throughout the entire series. Also in page 11, we learn right away that Dumbledore was the only one Voldemort was ever afraid of. McGonagall actually tells him, well, yeah, you, you're just too noble to use these powers. You're the only one that you know who was ever afraid of. So that's a big foreshadow event for later on in the series, not even just later on in this book. Uh, page 12 big quote they're saying he tried to kill the potter's son harry but he couldn't he couldn't kill that little boy no one knows why or how but they're saying that when he uh when he couldn't kill harry potter voldemort's power somehow broke and that's why he's gone then we obviously learn later on what that power was that harry had that voldemort couldn't harm him at that point in time so that's right. a huge foreshadow moment page 14 Hagrid is the one who actually brought Harry to the Dursleys, and that's a foreshadow, kind of like more of a full circle, I would say, for Deathly Hallows. Uh, Hagrid bringing Harry for the first time to the Dursleys, and then, you know, what happens later on? Don't want to ruin our fun for later on, but uh, <laughs> uh, page 14, Hagrid, uh, Hagrid said Dumbledore sounded relieved at last. And where did you get that motorcycle? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. That's a big foreshadow moment right there. Hey, yeah. the motorcycle from Sirius Black. You mentioned it earlier in your favorite moments. That's a huge foreshadow event there. Because like when you read it for the first time, you think that name never comes up again. You're like, oh, he just got it from some random guy. No, yeah. this is a huge, this is a huge, huge moment. Guy. Huge guy. Yeah. It's your boy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And page 15. Uh, talking about like uh, the scar that Harry had. I thought this was really cool. There was like a whole little tiny like um, excerpt that they had that I will, I'll read just a little bit of it. So McGonagall points at Harry's head and she's like, is that where? Whispered Professor McGonagall and Dumbledore said, yes, he'll have that scar forever. Then she replies, couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? And Dumbledore replies, even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in handy. I have one of myself above my left knee that has a perfect map of the London underground. So that's a big foreshadow of the, the uses that Scar Harry Scar does give him throughout the series. Because remember yeah. what it does, it allows him to do certain things that I won't talk about now. Um, page 28, when we talk about the vanishing glass and the uh, boa constrictor, foreshadow moment, Harry talks to a snake for the very first time. That's an ability yeah. that is huge throughout the entire series. Um, Page 57, we get that Voldemort's not dead foreshadow, which comes up later in this book because we see him. But, you know, he's out there biding his time, too weak to carry on, or, you know, he's not. So they, no one believes he's really gone. Well, guess what? That, that quote came true later on in this book. Page 65, Hagrid saying before he, this even happened, crikey, I'd like a dragon. That's a foreshadow <laughs> for what's about to happen. Yeah. Page 67, there's two books and names that come up big later on, like you were talking about, uh, with mm -hmm. Bagshot and Newt Scamander. Those are the two names, uh, Magical Creatures and Where to Find Them. And then uh, Bethilla Bagshot was uh, History of Magic, right? So mm -hmm. those are two big things that come up huge. Um, after that, this is pretty cool. This is a cool foreshadow I think a lot of people miss, bro. Page 68, Muggles cannot see the Leaky Cauldron. And why yeah, that, that is true. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. why that's important is because remember in book seven, or even actually I would say book five is where it first comes in, uh, Sirius Black's place, 
like I don't we're not going to get too far ahead of that yeah. so that's a big foreshadow of like how they can make it so muggles can't see uh certain stuff so thought that was pretty cool uh page 72 is where we first get introduced to the Nimbus 2000 obviously that's a foreshadow for Harry getting on the Quidditch team um page 73 we hear about vault 713 for the first time that's where the uh foreshadow of the sorcerer's stone yep. being held page 73 again this is more of a full circle grip hook was the first one to take harry to his vault that's the goblin well guess what he comes up big later in book seven deathly hallows yeah so pretty cool page 97 one i'm sure no one ever thought about i'm actually going to read it to them because it's just a funny thing that like it, i paid attention to because they're some of my favorites so i'll read it to you where are we at here so uh, this is when Mrs. they were at the Hogwarts Express and they were getting ready to leave. And this is Fred and George talking to Ginny. Hurry up, their mother said, and the three boys clambered onto the train. They leaned out the window for her to kiss them goodbye, and their younger sister began to cry. Don't worry, Ginny, we'll send you loads of owls. We'll send you a Hogwarts toilet seat. George! Only joking, Mom. So why is that a foreshadow? Because remember, at the very end of this book, when Dumbledore tells Harry that the Weasley twins tried to send him a toilet seat, but they didn't think it was hygienic and, and Madame Promfrey uh, confiscated it. So that toilet seat came yeah. up, was like foreshadowed, came back around. They tried to send it to Harry Potter in the, in the hospital wing at the end. So I thought that was pretty cool. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> 803, Nicholas Flamel is mentioned. Uh, that's when, you know, and we also learned here in this point in time in that same, at the back of the card, so that the uh, chocolate frog card, that's when his name yeah. was mentioned as a foreshadow. And then number two, in that same card, we, hit, we hear Dumbledore defeated Grindelwald in 1945. And that's huge uh, later yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So then page that's 106, huge. Ron foreshadows. He's the one that says he hopes Hermione is not in his house. It's like, whatever house she's in, I hope I'm not in it. Why is that a foreshadow? Well, how their relationship develops. That's why I put that as a foreshadow. He didn't even want her to be in the same house as him to where they end up, you know, seven years later. So Yeah, in uh, the long run. Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> then That's now awesome. at Hogwarts, the foreshadow events, Quirrell now has a turban where he didn't before the Leaky Cauldron. That's why they were making fun of it. Uh, page 126. This is where we learn Professor Snape wants the defense against the dark arts job. That's a big foreshadow. Uh, page 127, the third corridor on the right-hand side is out of bounds. That's a foreshadow for later on, being fluffy. Like, you know, that's where they, they were saying even from the beginning, yep. when they first get to Hogwarts, hey, don't go there. Well, guess what? We found out why they can't go there. Uh, page 137, 138, Snape, uh, Snape asks Harry where to find a Bezor. And why the Bezor is super important is because he needs to know where that is later on in the Half-Blood Prince in book six to save yep. Ron's life. I don't that's want to yeah, I don't want to get too hard, but yeah. And yeah. Then, Which that whole that whole situation with who he's talking to is like a almost like a foreshadow full circle moment, anyways. Yes. So that's really cool with the Bezor. Sure. Yeah. Um now on page 191, foreshadow Hermione knocks Quirrell over on her way to Snape. We realize how that comes into play later on. It's because you know Quirrell was the one that was trying to curse Harry the whole time, not Snape. Uh, page 191 again Harry catches a snitch in his mouth why is that important comes up huge in Deathly Hallows and specifically why he caught it in his mouth uh, page 199 Ron teaching Harry wizard's chess comes up later in this same book Ron's a master wizard's chess ends yep. up saving the day uh, page 200 Hagrid actually for Christmas gifts Harry a wooden flute that wooden flute they use to put Fluffy to sleep which doesn't happen in the movie but I'm not going to go there uh, <laughs> Page 201, <laughs> Harry receives the invisibility cloak. That's a foreshadow for every event they ever use with it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Page 206 and 207, this is, about the, this is a little bit about the mirror of Erised and where it was. So keep in mind, Harry was out of bed, guys, and he had nowhere to go. He found a suit of armor, and he said he must have been five floors above the kitchen. Let me break this down for you why that's important. Dungeons are the first floor. Kitchens are on the second floor. How do I know the kitchen's on the second floor? Because they send the food up through the ceilings onto the, the plates in the great hall. So if you do five plus two, what's that math give you? Seven. What room is on the seventh floor? Room of requirement. 
the first time the room yep. the first time the room of requirement made an appearance and it appeared to him the door was already open out of nowhere in t his time of need and so that's where the mirror of Arisad was was in the room of requirement before we even get a mention of what that is so thought that was pretty huge uh Page 214, Harry asks Dumbledore what he sees in the mirror, and Dumbledore tells him a pair of thick wool socks. This is a foreshadow of the Deathly Hallows <laughs> when they realize what Dumbledore actually saw in the mirror, which was pretty cool. Yep. Uh, 221, uh, could Snape possibly know they found about the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry didn't see how he could, yet sometimes he had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Well, yeah, that's a really big, <laughs> that's yeah. a really big foreshadow yeah. of yeah. lessons in book five. So that's <laughs> Uh, page 226 severus confronts quirrell in the forbidden forest that's a big foreshadow for what's about to come underneath the trap door page 229 harry looks up dittany in the 1000 magical herbs and fungi the reason why dittany is a foreshadow is because that comes up big in the deathly hallows when something happens to ron and they need to use it to heal him so uh that's a big foreshadow 256 harry's scar erupting in pain when voldemort was near pain like he never felt before that comes up all the time anytime like that scar it comes up twice like with the scar being handy like Dumbledore said and it hurting anytime Voldemort's near that's huge yeah. uh 257 uh the centaurs knew Harry was meant to die in the forbidden forest and that's why Bane was so mad and I'll explain that in my interesting facts yep. so yeah. I, I don't want to go too far in there but uh, that was a foreshadow 257 I'm sorry, 259, the planets have read wrongly before now, even by centaurs. I hope this is one of those times. And that's, uh, that's what Ferenc says to Harry, and that's a foreshadow, because unfortunately, the planets did not read wrongly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so written in the stars, so it was written, like, page 260, basically it was written in the stars that Lord Voldemort kills Harry. That yeah. is the big takeaway from there. Page 290, we learn that Snape hates Harry's dad because of his time at school with Harry's dad. We learn later on in book five why that is and what actually happened in that scenario and setting. Now, page 296, Fred and George, this is the full circle moment of when they send Harry the toilet seat. Page 298, Harry asks why Voldemort wanted to kill him in the first place and Dumbledore refused to answer. Well, that question and the answer to that question sets this whole series in motion. Like, this is... You know, not to get steal thunder from what we do later on, but there is a specific reason why Dumbledore or Voldemort wanted to kill Harry and Dumbledore didn't want to tell him. So, yep. yeah, and then just exactly. the last four, the last foreshadow that I have of this book is Dumbledore tells Harry that Snape hated his dad because his dad saved Snape's life, but doesn't kind of go into the whole thing behind that of, uh, you know, what caused them to need to save Snape's life in the first place. So right. like, yeah, I thought that was a, a big moment but those are all of the foreshadow events that i captured in sorcerer's stone do you have any that i didn't cover that you wrote down in foreshadowed events just a couple that's yeah. what i was gonna say most of mine were pretty much the same um the only other things i had was one the first one was um when aunt petunia sees the cat which was uh mcgonagall uh that was there in the book um also you know, they kept seeing the shooting stars, like I was talking about before, which uh, really foreshadowed, in my opinion, Hagrid, because um, they almost looked like comets, um, they were saying. But other than that, uh, I had a big question about this too. The gold watch that they describe with Dumbledore and the planets, that's, it's, not the time turner but it no i did a little bit of research on that i have that for my interesting facts is dumbledore's watch believe it or not okay awesome because yeah. i was wondering about that awesome see that's funny how that always works out <laughs> um <laughs> other than that i had uh just what i mentioned earlier you know when hagrid said uh they say he met vampires in the black forest and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag Never been the same since. Scared of students, scared of his own subject. Now, where's my umbrella? Uh, it was foreshadowing, you know, the whole idea of almost like, you know, Voldemort in the forest with the unicorn blood. Um, and then at Gringotts, where it said, enter stranger, but take heed of what waits 
Uh, the sin of greed for those who take but do not earn must pay must dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief you have been warned, beware of finding more than a treasure there, which is foreshadowing of much later on in the series. Um, other than that, I just had, I think there might have been two things, if that. Yeah, that's that's really everything else I had um, was pretty much the same of, of what you had though. So you hit it on the head. That was, that was good stuff. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's move it into uh, plot holes. I got, I got only about uh, maybe 10 or so bullet points here for plot holes that I thought were huge. Uh, page 53, when Aunt Petunia says, uh, Lily used magic at home during school vacations. Well, you're not allowed to use magic outside of the school. So where the hell did that come from? Yeah. So how in the world yeah. could have Lily used magic at home during those school vacations when students are not allowed to use magic at home? Someone please tell me that. And I'll even reference it by the, by the actual page number itself. I'm glad I have it. She says, new, shrieked Aunt Petunia suddenly. New, of course we knew. How could you not be my dreaded sister being what she was? Oh, she got a letter just like that and disappeared off to that, that school and came home every vacation with pockets full of frog spawn, and she was turning teacups into rats. So why are you turning teacups into rats, Lily? You're not allowed to be using magic outside of Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, so true. <laughs> uh, page 59, Hagrid tells Harry that he had his wand snapped in half. Well, how the heck does he still do magic with it with relatively no issue, where, you know, next book in Chamber of Secrets, when something bad happens to Ron's wand, like, all of a sudden, Ron's wand can't work. Uh, so thought that was kind of a big plot hole there. Do you have any thoughts on that one? No, I think that was good. That was good stuff. I, well, I just I wanted to know, like, do you, like, what are your thoughts on that specifically? On, on what, about the situation uh, of it? No, like on, on Hagrid's wand, when they snapped it in half, how he's able to use it with relatively no... Oh, well, that's what I was saying earlier. Uh, no, I'm I, thinking... I don't get why like he could use his, but like next book, someone else has something happen to their wand and it totally malfunctions. Oh yeah. Well, see, that's where I like assumed like I, because in all of Vander's, that's why I was saying earlier, all of Vander said, he kind of questions him and was like, is there any pieces of that left? Like, because in the book, you know, Hagrid is actually with him when he goes to get his wand. So I think he used half of that wand in the core. Yeah, he does use one. My, my question is not that does he do it. My plot hole issue is like, how come Hagrid is able to use magic with relatively no issue, but other students, when they use a broken wand, <laughs> all of a sudden, like, they can't, it's all malfunctioned. I don't get that. That's, that's the plot. Oh, man, head. this really, see, I wish I had a great debate card, because this brings me back to that day we were talking about on the mid-season hiatus. Oh, the, the verb, <laughs> verbs. Hagrid is the keeper of keys, so if you, there's the only side I have for this. If you are the keeper of keys, Clearly, you must be somewhat high ranking. So uh, people heard, say, you know, if you're elite, maybe you don't need a wand or anything. Hagrid's not an elite wizard at all. <laughs> like, you can't do any magic, That's the but. only side I could come up with for that. Because I, I see what you're saying. That is a plot hole. Very strange. The next one I have is in, yeah. page, two, in page 66. Like, it says <laughs> pupils should uh, wear the, carry their name tags which never comes up again. Never was that shown on the film. Not that it's a big deal. It's just something like, why was that never brought up? Like, and how does all the teachers just know their names anyways? There was never any name tags shown on the robes. Yeah. So Yeah, that's true. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. yeah. And then in page 70, Harry meets Professor Krill and Krill grabs his hand. So like, that's how we know at that point in time. It's not a plot hole. This one specifically, it's a plot hole because of the movie fucked up. And so that's the problem I've got with that. But um, here's the big plot hole. And pay attention to me here because I need your thoughts on this one. It's when uh, the quote says, Professor Quirrell scared of the students, scared of his own subject. So the problem with that is those two things there make it seem 
that Quirrell has had the defense against the target arts position before. How would Hagrid know if he's scared of students if he's never taught students? And the reason I'm bringing this up is remember this position is supposed to be cursed. No one has supposed to be able to last more than a year in this position. But clearly Professor Quirrell has because he's, if he's scared of the students and scared of his own position, like his own like subject, he would have already been teaching, like, like he would have had to have been taught before people knew what he was scared of. Like, how do you know he's scared of students? How do you know he's scared of his own subject? Because he actually did it. Meaning this is not yeah. Quirrell's first year as a teacher, meaning someone messed up along the lines about not, someone not being able to last more than one year as a defense against a dark arts teacher. Yeah, because he would have to know. Uh, I mean, if, in order to know that, you would have to have some experience with him. So unless he just gathered that <laughs> from, I guess, like a the pre-summer from when they ran into him at, uh, at Diagon Alley. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you 100% on there. there that's definitely a plot hole. Um, unless coral yeah because no because otherwise the position wouldn't be cursed so, yeah 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 100 i actually wrote down this that comes up later on this is in half-blood prince dumbledore this is how we know the position's cursed dumbledore says to harry you see we have not been able to keep a defense against the dark arts teachers for more than one year since i refused the post of lord voldemort so like mm -hmm. that is actually something that that's not just rumor that was said in the books that they haven't been able to do it for more than one year but how is that possible if Quirrell's been scared of his students and his subject, you wouldn't know that if he hasn't taught yet. <laughs> like, yeah, so yeah. plot yeah, hole. Yeah, that's so true. Plot hole. Yep. Then page one hundred, another big plot hole, bro. Wrong. Unless, however, unless they had summer semesters, <laughs> he taught in the <laughs> summer. <laughs> yeah, I, I got nothing for that though. <laughs> yeah, but this is another big one too. Page one hundred. Ron has Charlie's old wand. How is that possible? If the wand chooses the wizard, how does Ron have a hand-me-down wand from Charlie? So either yeah. one of two things happen. Like the wand said, no, Charlie, I don't want to be your wand anymore. I want to be Ron's wand. Or like yeah. someone screwed up the writing. Like you can't have like a hand-me-down wand if the wand chooses the wizard. So Yeah, I, I didn't get that either. A hand-me-down robe. <laughs> yeah. And a hand me down one. Yeah, that's I don't I don't get it either. That it was makes it in page one hundred. Ron was telling them all the things that were well, handed. So I got Charlie's old wand. Here here's the catch though. I could see how it could still work because there is an instance in Deathly Hallows where Harry uses another wand that's not his. Right. I'm not so saying you very well use the wand itself, but like if the wand chooses you, that's his first wand. That's his first ever. It's not like he had a wand and like they, he took someone else's like in the, like the thing that you're, the situation you're yeah. describing. This is his very first wand as a wizard. And so to have a first wand oh, as a wizard, yeah. it's supposed to choose you. You don't just get mm -hmm. yeah, here. Here's a wand. Hope it works for you. <laughs> like, good luck, man. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. No, oh, you're good. Strange. I get it. Yeah. Uh, page 127. The forbidden forest being forbidden to all pupils, but we'll just send 11 year olds in there for detention. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't understand. He's like, <laughs> yeah, double the point either. to say, like, the forbidden forest is out of bounds to all pupils, like, like years one through seven, but we'll send first year 11 year olds in there for detention. Okay. Unless you want to meet an unspeakable death, <laughs> like <laughs> the third floor corridor. That was for the. Oh, oh for the third floor corridor. But yeah, yeah okay. Forest. Cool. Still, and they sent him out there at 11 p.m. at night. At, at, <laughs> like, okay, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the other thing I had is just page 134. They were making fun of uh, Professor Quirrell's turban, which they wouldn't be doing if he didn't have it before. So that was just basically making me point out that the flaws of the movie, the plot holes of the movie, not the story itself about Professor Quirrell like having the turban at Leaky Cauldron. So I just had to put that in there. Um. Also, yeah. why wouldn't Dumbledore make a bigger deal that an 11-year-old student was jinxed and almost killed on a broom? Like, literally, like, yeah, like, like they no didn't, touch, they no didn't put down the sport. They didn't do anything. There was no investigation into, like, hey, this kid almost got killed. It was just like, oh, well, he was fine, so we're just going to sweep it under the rug. No problem. Yeah, no problem. Like, and what, <laughs> no what problem at all. For the safety, like, someone tried to murder a child, and we just moved past it with no real thought on it. Yeah. Yeah, that no, was definitely a huge pothole. 
Like, he's a powerful wizard. He could have figured out who did it. Like, he's, like, literally the most powerful wizard of all time. And he's just like, oh, you know what? Harry stayed on the broom. We're good. <laughs> like, we're fine. Yeah. yeah no, uh, no, no. Page 191. If Snape had to do the counter curse to save Harry's life, then why didn't Snape tell Dumbledore? Like, and I'm saying, like, I'm pretty sure that Snape would have told Dumbledore. So if Snape did tell Dumbledore and Dumbledore's like, well, I don't know what to tell you, man. That's what I'm saying. I've got some issues with Dumbledore in this book and, like, throughout the series. Like, like as you're the headmaster, you are responsible for everyone's safety. And so you trust Snape and Snape trusts you because you're the only one that gave him an opportunity after he came back from what he was not to give anything away. Like, they talk constantly and they're in communication with each other so you think that snape didn't tell him what was going on of course he did but the fact that dumbledore yeah. knew all this and was just like we'll figure it out it's fine yeah we're cool <laughs> we're cool man especially an 11 year old is going to take on the most powerful dark wizard in the world and he was just cool with it Ridiculous. an 11 year old <laughs> yeah like he lived once he'll be fine exactly that's a big problem and then you know snape really was like this like by was really sure that quirrell was behind the attempts at getting past like the sorcerer stone enchantments don't you think he could have maybe mentioned that to to dumbledore too and like maybe dumbledore's like well maybe i shouldn't like just fly off at the like breath of a letter <laughs> hey there's a letter here well gotta go guys i know someone's gonna steal this sorcerer's stone that'll make you immortal um, but you know what? I'm going to go meet with the Minister of Magic on a fake letter. That sounds right. Even Sansa Stark was questioning letters from birds. <laughs> the most powerful wizard of all time can't question a letter. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. Ridiculous. Once, like, obviously, it's very obvious someone's been trying to steal a stone. Like, Snape's leg was damaged. Like, you know, obviously, Snape's going to say something. Like, Harry just was attempted murder not too long ago. But <laughs> just cool, man. Okay, don't yeah, look man, cool. Cool. Got some problems with him yeah and, <laughs> and this is this is just a weird plot anyways like what are 11 year old kids like going into the forbidden forest for 11 p.m at night for a punishment of them being out late at night like what, what in the world is that like you guys are punishing them for doing what they like you're making them do what you punish them for being out yeah. of bed late at night so you're like oh you know what i'm gonna punish you by being out of bed late at night <laughs> like what in the world is wrong with these people i don't know <laughs> i only got three more uh we find out that uh snape uh, refereed the next match and Quirrell didn't do it again but why would there be an opportunity to do it again why wouldn't Snape just tell Dumbledore and Dumbledore handle it to begin with? Dumbledore actually went to the next match, like, just to make sure nothing happened. Like, why is this, like, there's, there were so many safety things that just were just forgot about that frustrated me. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so what's the other one here? Oh, right here. I'm going to read this exact area. This is the second to last one here in page 302. So this is where we really find out how big of a piece of work Dumbledore is. You guys ready for this? This is the exact quote. <clears throat> this is from Hermione. Well, I got back all right. I brought Ron around and that took a while. And then we were dashing up to the Owlery to contact Dumbledore and we met him in the entrance hall. He already knew. He just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? And hurtled off to the third floor. And Ron replies, do you think he meant you to do it? Sending you your father's cloak and everything? Well, Hermione exploded, if he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, Harry said thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted, me to, give, wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know. I reckon he had a pretty good idea what we were going to try. And instead of stopping us, he taught us just enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. 11 years old facing a serial killer. Dumbledore thought oh, he had... 11 years are you, old. Are we kidding? Like, what is the... We all most, totally zoomed past this when we read this. Most powerful. We just... When we read this... <laughs> yeah, we I don't really understand. zoomed past this. Like, we didn't realize, like, oh, shoot. Like, Dumbledore kind of sucks. Dumbledore literally, like, allowed Harry to die. <laughs> so like it was ridiculous unless he thought like because of his mother's love he had some sort of like shield you're gonna take that risk with a human that... life. you're gonna take well i think yeah, I, I don't you, know man just try it out like are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> no 11 keep in mind he's 11 
11 <laughs> years old. Like, he's only the only hope you have against defeating Voldemort for all time. Like, literally. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it. Much later on, they put together an entire order for this. And you're going to have an 11-year-old? An 11-year-old by himself. I think he knows no what help. goes on here. Well, yeah. Well, if he does, he kind of sucks his headmaster. <laughs> that makes students in danger for no damn yeah. reason. But that was all my like plot care. holes, brother. What plot holes did yeah. you come up with that I, that I missed out on? The only big plot hole that you missed out on that I put was... And this was a big one for the film purpose, not for the book, because okay. they explain specifically it. Film. But in the film, specifically the film, every all the other ones I think you hit really well, but specifically the film, Harry just figures out that like Hagrid got the dragon egg from Voldemort, like just like figures it out that he got it. Like, how did you figure that out? Like, please explain. No one gave you any information that like all the, like that's how you got the dragon egg. Like you just randomly figured this out somehow. So just throwing that out. I thought that was ridiculous. That was the only part when watching the film, I was like, what? Like, and he was like explaining it. And that's when like the dialogue, you know, you're like, okay, like now the dialogue seems a little bit cheesy and cliche. Like they're walking out of Hogwarts over to Hagrid's like little hut thing, which like in the book is like a ways away. And it seems like it's just right across the street. Like you just pulled a Jon Snow from, from Winterfell to all the way at Dragonstone. Like you just like teleported to the Hagrid hut and he's like explaining it on the way. That's how he got the dragon egg. That must be what's in there. Like he's just like, what? Like, you're just figuring all this out. And Hermione, like, figures everything out about the stone in some random, I hate to say this word, random-ass book she finds at the library. Like, not in the restricted section, not any special section. She just pulls out some book, and it's there. So those were the only, like, plot holes I had, which I can get over it. I was just like, come on, man. Like, I get you got to cut things in the film, but at least like make it a point to be like, hey, like this was in this newspaper here. Or like, that's how we figured this out. Not I just like pulled this out of my tail end. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Next section for you. I'll let you take Five it magical creatures, bro. Let's do what we did yeah, for uh, Marvel and Star Wars. And like, we'll start. You go your fifth. I'll go my fifth. And staggered all the way up until we both get to our number one. Cool. Good stuff. So I think you know what my number one is. But it's, we're starting from five up, though. Oh, five up. Okay. Yeah. Let me get to my page here because I was turned on another page in case I had to go back to it because I was already on interesting facts. No it's, worries. Uh, and I, I like this section, too, because, like, there's so many magical creatures that come up. Like, it'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some that I have on my list that you don't have on yours and some you have on your list I don't have on mine just because there's, there's a lot. And you don't think about it much in the Sorcerer's Stone unless you're reading it in depth and in detail. And so, uh, yeah, I've got, I got a good solid list of five. I'm curious to uh, see yours. Yeah, definitely. Of course, like what accidentally just happened was I pulled up my magical creatures of, so let's be specific. We're pulling up magical creatures from just Sorcerer's Stone. So like when I first did it, I had all sorts of creatures in there. I'm like, man, it's really tough to narrow it down, Josh. And you're like, not those. <laughs> Just keep it on what we've talked about. Um, but okay, so going from the bottom to the top, pulling this out, if I can find it here. Yeah, um, just start one at a time. So you'll you give your fifth, then I'll give my fifth, and you'll give your fourth, I'll give my fourth, and all the way till we get to number one. Yeah. Um, well, of course it's gone somewhere, but I can do this off the top of my head. Um, so last, I actually put Unicorn because I thought that was really cool. Um, they don't really do much in the film, <laughs> honestly. But, I mean, the fact of, like, the unicorn blood was absolutely visually stunning, I put. Like, especially in the film when Hagrid was, like, kind of, like, almost, like, licking it or drinking it or something. But it looked almost like nickel, like melted nickel. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Uh, so I ranked that for number five. Uh, number four, 
I I'll actually put, we're doing staggered. You do five, I do five, you do four. Okay, I, yeah, you go for number five. I'll yeah. use my number five is the Halloween troll. Uh, hey, yeah. I, I thought the Halloween troll was cool because a twelve foot like mountain of a creature with a club trying to kill students like that just doesn't come up in every single uh, fantasy universe. So I put yeah. my number five Halloween troll. Take number four. Uh, number four, I actually put the centaurs. So okay. from the Forbidden Forest, um, especially in the book, because in the book, which we'll talk about differences next week, but like they had like blue eyes and stuff. I really feel like they weren't portrayed that great in the film. Um, but I mean, you know, they kind of were like almost like guardians of the forest, like seeing what's out there. Uh, and they really had a connection to Hagrid. Um, so that's who I put as number four was the centaurs. Awesome. My number four that I put was the unicorns. Uh, unicorns hit number four in my spot because their blood, not only does it look cool, but like it keeps you alive even if you're yeah. in death, which is awesome. And not only that, like they are so beautiful and pure creatures that like it was like a, they talk about how great of a crime it is to kill one. And then, you know, like then to even drink its blood, you get a cursed life after that. It might keep you alive, but you're cursed for harming something so innocent. And they just look like chic, slimmery, like, you know, shimmering beings. It's, they were very beautiful and they obviously have uh, magical uses as well in terms of keeping people alive. So ringing in number four on my list is the unicorns. So take away number three, bro. Good stuff. Yeah. And I actually found my list, so I don't have to go off the top of my head. Um, I put a Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback. Uh, Cause kind of like what I was saying earlier, I know we don't get to see a whole lot of him and the dragons could have been a little bit better, but imagine if this was game of Thrones type dragons. I just imagine if this thing was full grown, this massive thing would have been taking on Vikings in like Norway and like the ice cold. Like I just picture some almost like metal dragon kind of thing. Like out of nowhere coming in, just burning the lights out on everybody. Um, so I thought, especially the name Norwegian Ridgeback was awesome and they had the egg and everything especially for this time uh that was a that was a awesome I thought it was really cool so that came in number three for you number three for me are number the centaurs three. the reason why centaurs are so high on my list and number three is because they can read the stars and predict the future uh really really uh, amazing talent for a creature uh, they are smarter than humans and people make the mistake of thinking that they're just beasts, which comes to back to bite them later on in the series. Uh, some yeah. people, uh, you know, they're powerful, they're intelligent, they're stargazers. And, you know, they, number one, they, they help, you know, Harry survive past the very first year of Hogwarts. So uh, if he yeah. wasn't there to uh, stop uh, Voldemort in like coming at him, who knows what could have happened, right? So number three in my list are the centaurs. Takeaway number two. Perfect. Number two, I put Fluffy. <laughs> he is awesome. Uh, he reminds me of Cerberus from like Greek mythology with the three heads or, you know, you have the Hydra. Um, and I thought it was very creative, just like a, a realistic like puppy dog, you know, like you, you have some music, you put him to sleep. So it's this whole idea of, you know, he's still like a dog, like he's still someone's like little child. But at the same time, he's this massive beast that they would put in the way. Uh, so I got to give it to Fluffy, man. He, I, he took a solid number two in my spot. Gotcha. Number two for me is Norbert the dragon. We're big dragon people here. I just couldn't give him the yeah. number one spot because, uh, you know, dragons do come up later on. So it's not as rare as my number one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being a dragon and being a Norwegian Ridgeback, like watching it hatch from its egg, that was, you know, that, that was the first time, you know, if you ever read about dragons in other books, it's mainly from, like, they're already kind of pronounced very rarely as a hatch. And the Game of Thrones did it to where, like, you know, Danny hatched the eggs and the, and the dragons were there. But this is the first one that I really got to see, like, a dragon as a baby in my head, kind of put together what that would imagine that to look like. Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback, just flowed smoothly. Um, it, it bit Ron's hand in the, in the book and swelled yeah. up. Their, their uh, fangs were poisonous. So just a badass creature rang in at number two on my spot. 
So give them your number one and I'll do number my, and I'll number mine. Oh, I gave you guys a little bit of a preview of this just because I couldn't hold it in back when we were doing GOT. Owls, baby. Yeah, number one. Hedwig, a beast. They carry the mail. Carry the mail. I don't see any other animal over there, any creature that's mythical that's responsible for the mail. Think about what a big job that is. If Harry didn't get his Nimbus 2000, you're going to be using that little training broom they gave you, like training wheels. You're going to be using, that's like rental skates, not rollerblades. That's what you're going to be using on that end. The, the, Harry wouldn't have even gotten to Hogwarts, wouldn't got no mail, no mail. I will even say this. Just like I was saying in GOT earlier this year at the very end when Josh was about to lose it. <laughs> there was a guy on YouTube that actually trained his owl to come back and hit the glass just like they have done in movies in the future. We'll see on this franchise that like smack against a glass and he would fall and just like faint. That actually happened. It's an owl on YouTube you can look up, but it took him like four times to figure it out. But it's been proven that owls are the only ones with the capacity to remember how to get back. The catches, sometimes they choose not to because they can be territorial when it comes to other, other uh, owls. But man, they just look gorgeous with the snow. It's soaring. Oh yeah, gotta give it to, uh, to the owls, baby. It's all about that head wig. Golly, so <laughs> I... I there owls are nowhere near in my top five <laughs> creatures at all. Uh, Fluffy took the number one spot for me because there's not many times you see a, a ginormous dog from that can sit on the floor and heads touch the ceiling, three heads like eyes rolling back. Like just okay. think of like a demonic creature that would tear you limb for limb, but also can be like persuade like persuaded by music and just fall asleep to just something like. It was very interesting. The creature itself is amazing. It never comes up again. We only see it the one time, but it was beautiful. It shows us a little bit of into Hagrid and how crazy he is and his love for nature and animals. So Fluffy, for me, took the number one spot. So just in a, in a, in a list, Chase, go ahead and go from five to one for you, and I'll do the same for me, and we'll move on to interesting facts. Five, I had my favorite owls. Hedwig specifically. Wait, five, five they had owls at one. Oh, I thought we were going from top to bottom. Sorry. Oh, top no, five. Top. Yeah. Uh, so bottom to top, five to one, right? Yep. Number five, I have the unicorn. Number four, I have the centaurs. Number three, I have the Norwegian Ridgeback Dragon. So Norbert. Two, I have Fluffy. And then number one, baby, it's all about them owls. Hooty hoot. Yeah, you know take it away. This is yeah, kind of like... funny because I feel like Chase, correct me if I'm wrong, but the college you went to, Kennesaw State, weren't there things an owl? That must be oh, why. I'm all about most... the owls. Yeah, we had, oh, we were uh, the brown fighting owls, though. Our mascot was owls. scrappy. <laughs> scrappy the owl and Sturges the owl. But yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, hooty hoot, man. That's what we would say before every football game. I'm a Gator now, but because uh, I'm getting my master's there. But, you know, always got a place in my heart for those owls. It's all, all about those owls, baby. If it wasn't for Hedwig, Harry would have never even gone to that school. That's ridiculous. That's an, uh, <laughs> not true because Hagrid had to show up and bring him there because the owls were not getting the job done and giving him the letter. But anyways, <laughs> uh, I'll go five to one in my list here. Five, the Halloween troll. Four, unicorn. Three, centaurs. Two, Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback dragon. Number one, fluffy. And that will knock out our top five magical creatures in Sorcerer's Stone and leading us to our very last section, our interesting facts. Chase, I'll let you take it away with uh, Quidditch. Yeah, man. Uh, by the way, I'm surprised neither one of us had goblins because I hate goblins. They were just, I, yeah, I don't know. They're weird. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's good. So, I'm not troll. I felt like it reminded me when it was laying in the film after it had gone down of like something from Killer Clowns with the dust all over him. Yeah, just wanted to sure. throw that out there. Um, so, okay. So, 
look in here. So this is going to get to some really cool stuff. This is actually my favorite section. Not going to take too long, but you know, that's why we, you know, at Harry Potter here, everyone knows the story, but this is where you get to see some cool stuff. I do want to say real quick, um, just going into this here. Of course, I just had it on the section I really wanted. Here we go. So we're not going to bring up all these people at all, um, especially because some of them come up later on. But the biggest thing like we were, I was talking about earlier, there are other wand makers. Um, so just for interesting facts here, actually the earliest wand makers. And you can get all of this. So if you want to go challenge me on this, I encourage you to do so. Go to pottermore.com. This is all straight from Joanna Rowling, which a lot of people didn't even know her name was Joanna. So you see, I actually do know what I'm talking about. Um, but so the earliest wand makers were actually, um, they called them trying to, I guess they were called like druids is what they called them. They were basically kind of like, um, almost like nomadic villagers, but they made them out of grapevine. Uh, Ollivanders came second when they were started in 382 BC, which is what a lot of people know, like if you go to Universal. Um, known druids were actually uh, Cleodona, which she was the first Animangus to ever uh, be around. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And she's also responsible for the antidote of Moondew, which is used in a lot of uh, potions and Snape's class. Um, and, the, so, and then the 13th century, we're not going to talk about that because there are some very significant brothers that come up later, much later on in the big book at the very end. Um, actually, a lot of the founders created their wands. We'll talk about one uh, in a few weeks from now in Chamber of Secrets. Um, this is a big one I wanted to say, which I thought was really cool. Violetta Bavaris, she was in 1909. She was a witch. She was the first witch to be the head of the Ministry of Magic. Um, she created her own wands and was a big competition to Ollivanders. And uh, she was from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I can't stand the Saints, but it's pretty what? cool that that was from America. <laughs> America! But I love everyone else, too. So I thought that was cool. Um, and she started her wand business in 1920 is when that started. And Ollivanders were actually known as, like I said, to be some of the most unreliable wands. Um, there's another one that started it right after her that comes up later um, towards Deathly Hallows. So we're not going to talk about them. Um, James Jonker, this is really cool. And um, Isolde, uh, they're the last ones I'll talk about here. Um, basically, well, I'll talk about two more and that's it. But basically, this is really cool. So they actually started... Um, uh, what's called uh, Lis, Lis Mira, which is the American uh, School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. They kind of, <laughs> I don't want to say dump on us <laughs> in Pottermore, but they say it's actually the least thought of <laughs> for School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, but it is the American school. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and he actually is most known for helping his wife create pearl wands. He, uh, James is, and James is the head minister of magic, and he is actually a muggle and is the only muggle to be a head of the minister of magic and actually only became that because Isolde was a pure blood from London uh, that uh, fleed to America, and James was a founder on the Mayflower and ran into her, and she basically fell in love with him. And that's how they got the school of the American ministry. So I thought, or the school of magic in America. So I thought it was cool. The Ollivander family, um, you know, they had Grant, Jerobel, Garavase, and Garrick. Of course, you know, Garrick gave Harry the wand. Um, there were some other Americans, but those were the biggest ones. Um, Sharakoba Wolf was American. Um, she was a wand maker. She was actually most known for making Thunderbird feathers, which were in competition with Phoenix feather cores. So that was very interesting. There. Reminds me of the Pokemon Zapdos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
and yeah, James Stewart was that uh, English man who is married to his old. So that was there about wands. That's all I wanted to bring up on that. Now to the really cool stuff. So uh, Quidditch, going into that. So like I was saying, a lot of people don't know Quidditch, right? So Quidditch actually isn't just like a typical football game or if you had a soccer game. Actually, like the longest game of Quidditch has gone on six months before and it actually ended in a draw. And they said what happened was uh, substitutes were so tired that they just quit. Like they actually were having people sleep during the day because it could just go on for months, um, which is wild. Like that's insane. Um, the evolution of Quidditch, this is really cool. So what happened, the way this happened according to the Wizarding Universe was they discovered a diary um, which founded, which was discussing like ancient broom, da- broom games is what they said. And in the diary, it was discovered in 1926 from Guthrie Lurken, which was like a, a German uh, wizard. And um, basically he was like, you know, discovering all these broom games that happened. And then uh, his wife was like witnessing her neighbors like fly on these broomsticks and play these games. The first one was they had an annual broom race over in Sweden, which is really cool. It was 300 miles. (laughs) Yeah, 300 miles long. And it was just a straight race. And then what happened from here was... um, They had what was called shunt bumps, which was in the 1800s, which was it took racing, but instead you had the wands on the brooms and it was like jousting. So as people would run at each other, you would shoot a spell and whoever flew off their broom thousands of feet in the air to their death, the person that was alive would win. Well, of course, they... (laughs) Yeah, I did have uh, a thing to say too about that. I had a que- not a question, more of a comment. Like you're talking about, like those yeah. racing. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of like Fast and Furious in the Sky, like racing, racing broom, <laughs> heavy drifts, like like hard turns and stuff on brooms. It just remind me like what Fast and Furious would look like in the air. But that's all I wanted to Isn't say. That, <laughs> and I, I got to use this word for this. Wouldn't it be a badass video game? Like if you had broom racing. That's, and you can choose the different types of brooms, which I'll tell you about the evolution of that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but basically what happened from that was, this is when um, it was Queerditch Marsh, who was like in a relative to these people. Um, she lived, she was outside her house and reported people that were her neighbors were on these broomsticks and they were kicking around a leather ball from the actual brooms, like midair. Um, and she said, uh, it was basically, she said, Tuesday, it's wet. They've got a new ball. They keep throwing it and kicking it at each other and trying to stick it in trees. It seems like a bunch of rubbish to me. But now they're using two big heavy rocks. And they keep flying around trying to knock people over off their brooms. So you can see where this is starting to go, where you have the beaters and the keepers, right? Um, And then it says the diary is actually on display in the Quidditch Museum in London, where you can still see that in the record of all this stuff. Um, And then the first record of Quidditch being actually developed from these rocks uh, was a Norwegian. And the letter says to his brother uh dear olaf how are you i am very well gwen hilda who is his grandmother has got in touch has got a touch of gra- dragon pox we enjoyed a game of quidditch spelled k-w-i-d-d-i-t-c-h at the time instead of the quidditch we know last saturday night i thought poor gun gun hilda was not up to playing it playing catcher and we had to use Radolf, the blacksmith, instead. The team from Ickley played well, though there was no match for us. We had been practicing hard and scored 42 times. Uh, Radolf got a a bluter to the head, which we know what that becomes, because Olga wasn't quick enough with his club. The new scoring barrels worked really well. 
<laughs> three uh, we put three at the end on stilts. <laughs> so they had their scores in the trees and they put stilts on them. So we can see where this is going. And originally they had nets actually in there. And then what happened was they got rid of the nets because um, they kept getting stuck in the trees where basically they would throw the balls through them and then they couldn't get them down. Um, and it said, but it's okay. She let us have a free meal anyways at her house. Genhilda has been a bit angry lately. I had to duck a couple of nasty jinxes in the air. But I got my fingers back now. I'm sending this with the best of all I got. Hope this makes it your cousin Goodwin. And basically what happened from here, the bluter became the bludger. And then um, where it says Randolph the blacksmith should have been fended off by Ugga. Uga, what that, that was carrying a club, those people became beaters in this situation. And the goals were on stilts, so those developed nowadays. And then what happened was the last, uh, so the addition of the fourth Quidditch ball didn't occur until the 13th century after all these positions became about. And what that is, is that's the golden snitch. So you're about to hear how that came about. So the arrival of the golden snitch. So a lot of people don't know there was a magical creature called a snidget. So a snidget was a fat gold bird, almost like a hummingbird. Well, um, in the 1100s, what happened is you had wizards that would hunt these things with uh, wands and they would shoot them out of the air and kill them. It was described basically in like mostly farmland and they would make stew out of them. Well, they almost became extinct. And what happened was uh, in 1269, uh, snidget hunting was um, made illegal by uh, one of the earliest ministries of magic in London. Um, and actually, it says a tapestry of a snidget and the actual copied down letter from the ministry that made it illegal, the bill, can be seen at the Quidditch Museum in London. Um, well, what happened was they almost became extinct, and there was a very famous, uh, uh, very famous um, guy high up in the ministry named Bragg. Well, what happened was he wanted to see what this sport was becoming about, and he was a very almost like King George, I would say, or almost like um, the Mad King from Game of Thrones like wanted to be more enthused by it. Well, he was a previous snidget hunter. And what he decided was he would let one of these snidgets go that were so rare. And, you know, the person that catches this snidget, um, you know, would win the game is how that would happen uh, with a summoning charm. Well, what happened was his wife was against it because the snidgets were illegal. And she was like all about like the environment and stuff. And in the middle of the game, went out and tried to rescue the snidget. Well, what happened was during the middle of the game, uh, basically during the middle of the game, what happened was uh, her name was Madistry Ravenold. Um, she rescued the snidget and repelled it. And then basically the repel spell knocked everyone off their brooms onto the ground. Um, well, so she established what's called the Snidget Foundation. And basically her own husband um, didn't want to prosecute her from the ministry. So what they did was they replaced that Snidget with a gold-shaped ball. And she, in an effort so that she wouldn't be sued, decided to bewitch the ball <laughs> so you had basically the guy that was in power still getting what he wants but they came to a compromise so now you have the golden snidget ball and um that's how the golden snidget came to be and then from there uh that's when you started having which is the national quidditch league which is basically like the nfl uh for quidditch from there um from here, I'll say, so it said uh, the golden snitch for the first six months, it was developed, w evaded capture. So no one on either 
team won. Like it just ended in draws. Um, this first game was the longest one that I was saying, and it started in 1884 and no one ever caught the snitch and it ended in a draw and it went on for six months. Um, keepers were like chasers is what happens. They became the role of chasers. Beaters, um, you know, the, the blooders became the beaters. Um, chasers is actually the oldest position in Quidditch. The seeker became the most prominent position. New rules that have been developed since this time. There's no limit on how high you can go up. Um, used to, you could only go a certain length because they wanted to keep people together. Uh, and then after that, referees started actually giving people points for penalties. Um, because what happens was there was no limit on penalties and so many captains were getting taken out of the games. You know, no one had anyone to lead the team. Um, and then there became a, a rule that was instituted recently where no substitutions were allowed. So if you ever see why in the movies you don't see any substitutions in the game, there has been a rule for that. Um, no broom is allowed to be bewitched. <laughs> That's a big rule. Um, also. Uh, the game of Quidditch ends now when the snitch is caught. Fouls, there's over 700 fouls in the game. Most of them are spells that can happen to an appoint opponent or charms. Um, referees, this is really cool. Only top Quidditch players are ever considered to be referees because how many uh, Quidditch players they have to take into account of. Um, Quidditch teams, uh, the biggest ones are actually in British, uh, Britain and Ireland, which is where uh, the Quidditch National League is. There are other leagues, but this is the biggest one. Um, the Professional Quidditch League is what it's called. It was established in 1674 with 13 teams. Um, the Appleby Arrows, they have like a big silver arrow on them. They won the cup in 1932. Um, and actually every time someone catches the snitch there, what they do is they shoot arrows out of their wands at the end of the game, which is really cool. Um, they got the Bally Castle bats, um, the counter Philly catapults, which were formed in 1402. They're the oldest, uh, oldest franchise. They actually won the European Cup in 1956, so they do different cups as well. Um, Dangerous Die is actually the biggest player on that team. Um, he is known for one of the most exciting players in the game. The Chudley Cannons, they're straight up in the book by J.K. Rowling, Quidditch Through the Ages, which is what all this is from, the same book Harry had. Um, they're known as basically being garbage. Um, they've been in the league since 1892 and can count on a number of times they've actually even been to their Quidditch playoffs. So, <laughs> yeah, sounds like the Falcons. Um, which next is actually, they have the foul mouth Falcons, um, which ironically, they wear dark gray and white, but they're known kind of like the Dirty Birds being the dirty team of the league um, with fouls and that sort of thing. Hollyhead Harpies, which is a team of only witches. There are no wizards on that team. Actually, 1953 is still considered one of the best they've ever played. It was seven days long and actually the captain of the Hollyhead Harpies was proposed to by a wizard of the opposing team, which has still gone down to this day. Um, Kinmare Kestrels, they were founded in 1291. Um, Darren O'Hare is a famous uh, seeker for them. Um, Montrose Mag Magpies, um, they're pretty famous in the Irish League. Um, eh, let's see. Uh, the Pride of Portree, they got them. They were founded in 1292. Puddlemore United, found in 1163. Uh, 22 league wins in European Cups. Um, the Tutshaw Tornadoes, they were founded in 1520. They hold the British and Irish record, and their seeker has been in the league 22 years. The same seeker, still there to this day. <laughs> the Wingtown Wanderers, uh, founded in 1422. Uh, this actually started, the reason they have that name is Three Sisters started the team. They used to wear blood red robes and what they were known for is being butchers. And they would actually hold up cleavers 
before the game because they used to butcher cows and stuff. Still to this day, they actually hold up the cleavers whenever they score. So yeah, just completely random. But you know, you got other ones, uh, the Wimburn Wasps. I'll just go through a couple of these. Um, so that was the last one in the league. That was the 13th one. The other ones are really just smaller teams. But the first ever Quidditch World Cup was actually in 1473. Um, most teams in the final were European. Um, they had the Transylvania. Uh, Transylvania actually was in the uh, cup that year, uh, which is pretty big because most of them were from um, one, uh, you know, London or Ireland or Scotland. Um, 1652, the first European cup was played. Um, and it, it's played every three years now in Europe. Um, Australia and New Zealand, this is kind of cool. Um, so it was adopted by the New Zealand Ministry of Magic, Quidditch was in the 17th century. They're actually most known for the fastest Quidditch players in the world, Australia and New Zealand. Um, Africa uh, was introduced by European wizards. Most notable is Uganda. And uh, with uh, they have... Uh, Patonga Proudstick, who's like a big player over there. Um, and they actually have only won one World Cup, and that was in 1986, and they're known for their charms. North America, this is where we were talking about before we finish up on Quidditch here. Basically, they like, I don't want to say they crap on us all through this book, but what they developed was basically they say very few teams ever came out of North America that were any good. Um, Cause in the 17th century, basically what happened, it says the United States has not produced many world-class Quidditch teams because of quad pot. <laughs> what quad pot is, is Abraham quad pot, very similar to baseball, took a quaffle, from the old country and intended to recruit a Quidditch team. The story goes that the Quaffle had inadvertently come in contact with the tip of his wand and uh, he shot it into his trunk when it finally took out and then he began to throw it around with his wand in a manner. So basically he started practicing throwing his wand into the trunk of like what was on the back of his broomstick. Um, so what happened was this basically became like baseball, but nowadays what they do is they throw this quad pot into like this, um, encasing potion and it explodes. So the ball explodes. So it's basically like baseball, but it does say the United States has the Sweetwater All-Stars, which is the only team that's ever been any good. Uh, they were founded in 1993 which that same year, actually, they played a five-day match with the Fitchburg Funches. Most of the players are from Massachusetts, almost like hockey players. Um, and uh, Brockovich III has been the captain of the last two World Cup teams um, for the United States, but they won the Cup then. So we only have seven World Cup league appearances since. And we've only won the cup once. Even Canada has three famous Quidditch teams that made multiple appearances in the Quidditch World Cup. But basically, the United States isn't that good. Um, even South America plays Quidditch. Peru is very known over there uh, for their team. They actually have a big team of sorcerers. They say they cast spells. Um, and then Asia is not very known at all. Actually, the only ones from Asia that is known is Pakistan and uh, Japan, which it says they almost won a game against Lithuania Gargoyles in 1994, but have lost every game since. So that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, the last little segment here of Quidditch is just the racing brooms. Um, so the Oak Shaft 79 was the first one made. Um, it was made for endurance uh, and gained popularity. The Moon Trimmer was next. Um, it really couldn't go fast at all. Uh, the Silver Arrow finally reached the first speeds of 70 miles an hour. And then we had the Clean Sweep 1 in 1926, which really set the tone for the Nimbuses. 
Um, so you had the Comet 140 next, which was the real first racing broom. It was originally developed for the foul mouth Falcons I mentioned. However, most people in the public couldn't purchase it because it was really developed for the National Quidditch League. Um, the Tinder Blast was an offset version of that that was available to the public. And then the Swift Stick was available to the public that actually had the same amount of durability and speed as that one. Um, the Shooting Star tried to come out, which was the cheapest broom, uh, but it tried to make it go higher. It didn't work. They failed. That company went out of business in 1978. The Nimbus 1000 came out. Uh, the Twigger 90, which was another one that was like an offset company, had a glitch. They went out of business. Then you had the Nimbus 2000 and then the Firebolt uh, later on. So um, just the last couple notes here. Um, a cool, uh, I saw a cool different moves they have uh, is called the, the Bludger Backbeat is a, a play they have or the Doppelbeater. Um, the hawk's head attacking formation that's a pretty badass play like a, a play action um, and then the only other thing I was going to say that I did leave out was in the history when they were doing the jousting right uh, there was a rule uh, when Quidditch first started that actually everyone could only fly vertically in the air when the game started this actually stopped because what happened was people were just flying directly vertically up into that point. And when they would mesh, they would all crash. So for years, what would happen is the game would start and everyone on each team would die. So, um, yeah, so that's the history of Quidditch. Now, you know, it, it actually is a real thing in the wizarding world, uh, that there is a museum for. So I'll let you take it from here with the mirror of your set. Awesome. Yeah, man. I've got like a, just a couple of quick points um, of things I found interesting. Dumbledore's watch, the first thing that I wanted to mention. So the idea behind Dumbledore's watch, it's not proven, it's not been confirmed, but the rumor is, is that it works very similar to the clock at the borough where each hand points to like a certain person. But the difference is, is because it's Dumbledore, it can show any 12 people that he wants at any given time. They chose 12 to match the Muggle World clocks. So that way, if anyone found it, if anyone lost it, it would look kind of similar to their time, even though it just had planets on it. So the thought is it's very similar. And uh, Dumbledore can see whoever he wants at any given time with his pocket watch and where they're located. Now, when we get into uh, the coat of arms, I think this is something you mentioned, I, I, but we didn't mention it today. I wanted to make sure we did this. It's a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake. A lot of people get confused because they hear Ravenclaw and they think that the, uh, the, the sigil is a yeah, that was good. and it's not, it's an eagle. Um, also, a really big thing I have here in page 63, Harry asks Hagrid, wizards have banks? And Hagrid says, just the one, Gringotts, run by goblins. So while Chase went through and talked about <laughs> how there's so many more wand makers, there really is only one wizarding bank in the entire magical world. Do you realize how inconvenient that is? Like they only have one bank and how is that even possible? I don't know, but it's in the book. It's written there. Um, the bricks above the trash can at the Leaky Cauldron, it's three up from the trash can, two across to get into Diagon Alley. This is another really important thing that really people skip over. You guys know when Harry enters his vault and he sees all the money there and Hagrid tells him, hey, your parents left you money. Well, keep in mind, guys, Lily and James Potter were only 21 years old. So how could they have accumulated all that wealth? They're actually, James's parents were independently wealthy. The Potters were independently wealthy. Um, I actually have exactly where the wealth started from and how it got passed down to James. So... Uh, the very beginning, it started with a guy named uh, Linifred of Stinchcomb. He invented medicinal potions. <laughs> and then 
Uh, he laid a foundation that future generations would build on, though the specifics of each generation aren't recorded in the story. The fortune was then greatly expanded by Harry's grandfather, which is uh, James's father, Fleamont Potter, who invented Sleek Easy's hair potion. So they've been wealthy in their family. That's how James has that money. Because I was thinking to myself, 21 years old, how did you leave him a small fortune? Well, his family has been rich. So uh, that's awesome. Something yeah. cool there. Uh, Voldemort's wand was 13 and a half inches. You and Phoenix Feather. Um, <clears throat> there was one cool thing I wanted to mention too that's, that's talked about that uh, Dumbledore with the um, 12 uses of dragon blood. So they're still a secret because they're, so they're coming up with something in the upcoming, but JK Rowling uh, verified four of the 12 uses for dragon blood for us. I'm sorry, she verified three and the fourth one is the nine other uses that are unconfirmed. But number one is cleaning ovens. Number two is removing spots. And number three is curing Verica. So those are three of the 12 uses of dragon blood. And then to get to my big thing here with the mirror of Erised, now across the top of the archway in front of the mirror, there is a, a phrase that looks like it's in a different language. And it says, Erised stra eru oit ube kafru oit an woshi, wosi. And if you actually take a mirror to that and flip it around and space the words properly, what it really says is, I show not your face, but your heart's desire. So it was created at some point in the 19th century. The creator is unknown. So there's a lot of speculation on why would we someone make this? And there's thoughts that it is a practical joke because people will waste away their lives just looking at that, hoping to find uh, what they see in the mirror. So they'll waste their lives away. Um, it's, it's brought up a couple times throughout the series. It's referenced in... Uh, three parts of the books there. So, and we find out also super important that Dumbledore did lie about what he saw in the mirror of Erised. Now, in terms of what happened to it after it was removed from Hogwarts and no one knows its current location. So that's awesome. a little bit about the mirror of Erised there. And then I believe there was two more things I wanted to touch on. Yes, dragon breeding was outlawed by the Warlocks Convention of 1709. So that is why no one is allowed to keep dragons like Hagrid tried to with uh, Norbert. Um, and then the last one here, this was the super important, interesting fact that I talked about with the centaurs and the prediction here. And they said, Mars is bright tonight. That's said multiple times by Ronan and Bane and Friends even says it once. Number one, centaurs have the ability to read stars and predict the future. Mars is the Roman god of war. So the centaurs basically saw the war coming. And that's why they got mad at Ferenz because Voldemort was meant to kill Harry in the forest, but Ferenz saved him. And the Bane tells me, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Have we not read what is to come in the movements of the planets? So basically Bane wanted Ferenz to let Harry die there in the forest because it was read that Harry would die in the forbidden forest in the planets. Now, we've that's kind of a foreshadow because of what happens in deathly hallows where everything goes down so big badass moment there centaurs predicted this from book one the entirety of the series which is really cool very easy to miss but yep and then just the last thing um the, the I, there was actually the third spell i wrote it down here on accident instead of favorite moments that we learn is the leg locking curse not the uh, petrific totalis that's the fourth one the leg locking curse is locomotor mortis and that's the third one that they learned. But anyways, uh, those are my big interesting facts uh, with the Harry Potter. And that would end our content for the day. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, real quick, just before we finish up, uh, I do want to comment on the Mirror of Eriset, which is really cool. Because like you said, it is true. No one knows where it's at. Uh, just a cool thing I looked up. You can look this up on Pottermore.com. Because they say Harry went to the ministry and started to work for the ministry years later after the Battle of Hogwarts and stuff. But the uh, where they think could possibly be the mirror there is that there is an event called the Calamity. Um, and what that is, is where all these ancient artifacts went missing. And how that relates is 
the game they came out like last year, which JK Rowling helped write the game where you're finding all these items for Hagrid's. Uh, basically, they think it was a spell where all these items went missing. So that's actually one of the items you're supposed to try to get back. Um, so I thought it was cool. I don't know if that's really what she intended. I just thought it was cool how they kind of worked it in there. But yeah, no one knows where it's at. Um, last couple of things I just wanted to say, which this won't take any time. I was mentioning this to you, uh, Hogwarts. So um, Rowena Ravenclaw, actually, a lot of people don't know, thought of the name Hogwarts. She had a dream of a hog falling off a cliff that had warts all over it. So they named it Hogwarts. Um, because the cliff that fell off was the place where Hogwarts was built on, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which is where Hogwarts is built on. Um, the only other thing besides that I was going to say um, was Merlin, which was really cool. Uh, that I forgot to bring up earlier, but uh, basically not even in Antioch Prevail. So the way I found this was because I was looking up um, Antioch Prevail and Ptolemy, which remember we were talking about Ron and his cards, right? So Ptolemy, um, basically there's not really anything even known on him. Um, he was known as actually being a philosopher, um, almost like being like an Aristotle kind of person. And he was known for uh, dark arts, but that's it. Um, actually, the other one who was, uh, that, I'm sorry, that's a pick, what's it, Ptolemy? And then the other one is Agrippa. Uh, yeah, Agrippa. Agrippa. Yeah, Agrippa. Agrippa is his brother who is actually locked up for being a dark arts wizard. Okay. Um, he didn't die in the prison, but um, Cornelius Epiphory is his name and uh wind up being persecuted later on uh for like dark magic so that was cool but merlin they said he was a master of the dark arts and sorcery and the other person that ron said he had in the books um i'm not at the page right now but it was like uh mega or something um i was trying to find it here in my notes it was a um it's one of the ones he wanted, but basically, like, it was Merlin's sister is who it was. And actually, Helena Bonham Carter in the 1986 movie Merlin played her. And it was the half-sister of Merlin. And it was said that was kind of like the Grindelwald and Merlin moment um, where he took her out. And they actually thought about mentioning her because that quote is actually in the book. Um, mentioning her in the movie because it was kind of like an Easter egg, not in Sorcerer's Stone, they weren't, but like later on, because actually Emma Watson played her in a school play earlier on. Um, just last couple things was uh, big Quidditch players for just Hogwarts was Minerva McGonagall. She's known for having the most famous fouls in the school. She actually fell off her broom um, and got knocked unconscious uh, hundreds of feet in the air in a famous Quidditch match. RJHK, you can see him actually in the trophy case in the film. With James Potter, James in the cup, and that was 85 and 86. And besides the Harry years, uh, they didn't win it at all. Uh, Slytherin was so well known all the way from 1724 to this is how many years 1724 to 1978 they always had a notable captain that's how powerful Slytherin was um, actually Regulus Black that's related to Sirius Black was the most notable seeker in 1978 and then in 1991 is when they had that really famous team which had a lot of all-stars like Marcus Flint, Adrian Palsy, Chaser, um, a lot of famous keepers. Um, the only other two, Hufflepuff has actually never won the cup. They're known just not for being any good. The Ravenclaws actually dominated the 80s. They were no good until then, and they haven't been that great afterwards. They've been okay. But in the 80s was Brennan Doyle, who was a famous keeper, and Andrew Egru, who is an African-American, still considered to be the best seeker to ever play the game today in 1981 and then in 1993 
They had Robert Roger Davis, who was a known captain. Um, but like really they weren't even a good team then. And actually the only Hufflepuff to be a good Quidditch player that's notable is Quidditch captain. We'll talk about later Cedric Dig- Diggory. So those were just the last kind of um, things I wanted to mention there. Um, Helga Hufflepuff, a lot of people don't know, she was actually even known for giving house elves their first jobs in the kitchen. It was known for her recipes that were handed down. Um, uh, not Regina Ravenclaw. What Rowena? Oh, Rowena. Yeah, Rowena. Rowena Ravenclaw. Um, you know, we'll talk about a big artifact of hers later on that she actually gave to her daughter at one point, and um, then they sent out to go get it, which her daughter was killed. Um, now to this day, we know him as Blood Baron, but that was a big point with her, um, and her best friend was Helga Hufflepuff. Uh, you know, Salazar Slytherin, we'll talk about him a lot in Chamber of Secrets, but Godric Gryffindor, that was his best friend. Um, he is known for his charms, very powerful uh, magician, but it's two things he's known for is, of course, the sorting hat and um, the uh, sword, which we'll talk about later on, which they still don't know why that can be pulled from the hat to this day. But that was just the last interesting fact. Cool. Yeah, we covered a lot today, and I was surprised at how much it took, even for just a small book like Sorcerer's Stone, but it's one of the biggest uh, franchises for a reason, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was, it's a lot of fun. It's one of those things that we can kind of sit back, relax, and kind of do it without, you know, worrying that we're missing a bunch of stuff, because we added a whole bunch of stuff to it. I'm really happy yeah. with, uh, you know, tackling the Sorcerer's Stone today. Now, next week, again, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to stick with Sorcerer's Stone, but all we're going to do is label every single difference that each of us noticed between the movie and the book. And then the week, uh, the, the week following that, we'll get into Chamber of Secrets. And depending on you know the detail in Chamber of Secrets and the type of notes and interesting facts we find there, Chamber of Secrets might take two episodes before we get to difference of books and movies. We'll kind of play it by ear and see how it goes. But uh, yeah, this, this will close up Sorcerer's Stone in terms of the five major key points of the outline that we tackled today. Chase and I's favorite moments, the foreshadowed events, potential plot holes and discrepancies, top five magical creatures in Sorcerer's Stone, and interesting facts. Yeah, man, I think we, uh, this was a, a, a awesome premiere for this arc today, and I, I'm just so stoked for it. It's going to ride us out through the rest of the season. And uh, like we always say, this is uh, Chase and Josh. Factor Fantasy. Signing off. off.